And this workshop is organized by Profession and Education Activities Subcommittee, IEEE Power and Energy Society Young Professionals. Today, our respected uh, guest speaker is Dr. Rodrigo Fuentes. Dr. Rodrigo is Technical Account Manager in Gurubi. He is expert in different optimization techniques applied to the optimal use of hydro and thermal units and solving optimization problems. Today, he will discuss about introduction to mathematical optimization with Gurubi. Now, I would like to please welcome Dr. Rodrigo for further discussion. Please, Dr. Rodrigo. Uh, thank you, Shag. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, I appreciate, I'm, I'm pretty uh, happy to be here with you guys uh, today. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk, as Shah was talking, uh, mentioning, we will we'll talk about Gurobi. And we will have two tracks today. First, uh, we will discuss optimization in a, from a beginner to intermediate level. And I will show an example using one of our interfaces to solve a unit commitment problem. The second track of the problem, which will be the last third of the of the uh, of the three hours we have allocated, we will go deeper into uh, into uh, MIP mixed integer programming and how it relates to SUC security constraint unit commitment. So uh, both sessions uh, uh, will end with a Q and A se section where I welcome you uh, any any kind of questions. So without further ado, let me let me switch to my uh, slides. And I'm sorry, I was. Uh, I, I think we had a little uh, glitch on the on the communication, but I think uh, we're here, and that's that's what matters. Okay, so please let me know when you can see my my slides. Yeah, it's it's okay. All right, perfect. So let's let's get going. So as I said. We have uh, two parts in this uh, tutorial. We're going to introduce Gurobi as a solver. Uh, we'll talk about how Gurobi can be used in academic environments, what resources are, are available to users in academic environments, and then we'll talk about both linear programming and mixed integer programming. We'll have an example in a Q&A section. For the second part, for the second part, we will talk about the MIP algorithms and how such algorithms have benefited applications and power sy systems. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the difficulty in expressing models and how tractable they are, the use of heuristics, how mixed integer programming has evolved over time, mixed integer programming and security constraint unit commitment, and of course, a Q&A section towards the end. So for the first part, uh, I'll, I'll start by saying uh, what Gurobi is. Gurobi is a, is a high performance library written in C programming language. This, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, library, this library will take an optimization problem that has been posed in canonical way. We'll, we will see what that is. And that optimization problem can be solved by the software. So the, the, the user, the end user, only has to worry about defining an optimization problem in canonical way. If, creating some or, or gathering some data to feed the, the, the problem. And then the solver, Gurobi, can take such formulation with data and return a solution of the optimization problem. These are the Gurobi founders. The Gurobi founders, uh, I assume that in, in the audience, we have we have users of Gurobi, but we also have uh, users of other solvers. The, the founders of the company from left to right are uh, Robert Bixby, Gonzalo Gu and Ed Rothberg. <clears throat> if you take the first two letters of their last names, you get the name Gurobi. They founded the company 14 years ago, and Dr. Bixby on the far left, he was the original developer of Cplex. At some point, they decided to start Gurobi, and Gurobi as a company only focuses, we only focus on the numerical optimization solver. We don't have any other products. Uh, other vendors, uh, uh, the optimization tool is one of many products that they have. In our case, the only product that we have is the optimization solver. Gurobi as a solver can solve a variety of problems, a variety of problems that fall in this category. So basically, basically, if you have a problem with 
linear constraints or quadratic constraints. And if you have uh, continuous variables and or integer variables, Gurobi can handle a problem of that sort. The constraints do not necessarily have to be a, a convex. The same goes for the objective function. And Gurobi also includes, also includes the ability to handle uh, nonlinear functions via piecewise linear approximation. So the, the, the range of problems that can be modeled with Gurobi is pretty broad and it can be handled by, by, by the solver. This is, this is how the, uh, the tool has evolved over time. Uh, since version version 1.1, you can see here on this chart uh, two things. The red line on the chart indicates how faster the solver has become over time. So if you look at version 1.1 14 years ago to the current version we have 9.5.1, the speed of the solver has gone up by a factor of 70. So if we run on the same hardware, the same set of problems that we have. We have a collection of problems that we test for every version. Our speed has gone up by a factor of 70. Also, also from that same set of test cases that we use to benchmark the versions of our solver, the number of cases that we cannot solve has been going down over time, which means that the solver has become more and more robust. So that, that's a, that's a, that's a, 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 this is a reflection of uh, we put a, a lot of effort on R and D, a lot of effort in R and D, and we try to make with every release the solver more robust and more uh, uh, and faster. Uh, to give you an idea, we have we have across the world over 2,500 customers, split among over 50 types of industries. So today today we're talking about uh, power systems. Uh, that, that's one of the, the, the areas of, on which numerical optimization is used. We also have other areas. We have the hotel industry, food industry, medical, insurance. Here are some of uh, the big clients on, on this uh, chart that have agreed with us to display their, their logos, uh, sports. There's all sorts of applications and use cases where numerical optimization can be used. As long as you can produce a mathematical model that reflects to some level of accuracy at a business problem. And if we have a, 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 the necessary computing resources and the use case allows for a numerical optimization to be used, very likely Gurobi can fit in that scenario. Now, in academia, for, for academic users or research users, which I, I believe is most of the audience today, uh, we have different types of licenses that you can get. When you get an academic license from Gurobi, you get access to the full version of Gurobi. We don't have an academic version that is different than a, than a commercial version. You have access to the same solver. We don't restrict by number of variables, by number of constraints, by memory, by concurrent runs. You get exactly what our customers get. So our academic licenses uh, have to be requested from, a, from, a, from an academic network. So as long as you request a license from a private network uh, that it's uh, associated to an educational institution, you will get a license for one year. The type of licenses that we offer for academics are three, named user licenses, floating licenses, and web license service. I'm gonna talk about each of them. And after the call, if you wanna get a license and, and if you have any problem doing so, you can reach out to me if you have questions on how to get an academic license, if you're interested. The, the most common license our, our uh, academic users have, it's a named user license. Basically, you go to your uh, uh, computer in, in, the, in a university network, and then you request this license from us. Once you get this license, you can install this license on your assigned computer. This license is assigned to an individual user. You can run on your laptop, on your dedicated desktop at, at, uh, in school. And this license will allow you to use Gurobi on that machine. This license allows for concurrency and uh, it's the same license that our customers get. The next license that we have for academic or research institutions is a floating license. This license has a difference and that is that only one person has to request the license. So let's say that you have a computer lab where you do a, a, a simulations, 
you have you have a maybe a professor has a a group of grad students or or you have a, a, a high performance cluster where you have powerful machines and you have different users that can connect to that cluster this license allows you to set up a license server on an individual machine this license server is not going to uh, it's not going to solve uh, uh, optimization problems all this license server is going to do is grant authorization to run Gurobi on client machines that have access to such license server. So anyone connected to the license server remotely on the same private network can run Gurobi locally as long as they have visibility to this license server, which sits in a, in a university or research institution. So the license here only has to be set up in one machine, and then the users that point to such license server just have to install Gurobi locally and then configure it to point to that license server. So this is another option for academic institutions. Finally, another license that is available for, uh, for academic uh, uses is the web license service. This is a fairly new license that we have. And the nice thing about this license is that it allows you to run Gurobi and Docker containers or, or containerized environments. So perhaps if your interest is solving optimization problems, yes, but you also have a inclinations towards software engineering. If you're exploring a solution that you want to see how scalable it is with the use of containers, you can run with an academic license, Gurobi inside a containerized environment if needed. So this is another license that you have access to. All these licenses you can request from an academic uh, institution. Finally, finally, I want to talk about uh, a type of a type of program a program that we have that is not very used <coughs> i'm sorry called take gurobi with you this is something that we don't see a lot uh, being used but it's very very powerful so if you are a phd student masters or undergrad and you have a gurobi license and you finish your studies you have access to a gurobi license for an additional year if you start working within that year. So if you start working within that year following your graduation, you request a license from us, a Take Gurobi With You license. You can get a license for one year that you can use in your, in your uh, new job. And that license is only assigned to the person who graduated, but it's, it's, it's a great license to use if, for example, let's say that you were doing some work in collaboration with industry, or if you have a great idea and you need some time to, uh, to produce a prototype, a proof of concept solution, you have one year to do that with one of these licenses. So it's it's a good license to have for an additional year beyond the studies if you start working and you work in a line of work, of course, that involves uh, optimization. So you can take advantage of this. Uh, I want to talk about the, the resources that you have uh, at your disposal to use Gurobi. So if you go to our, our website, gurobi.com, we have a lot of documentation there. We have a quick start guides. We have different examples and different programming languages. Of course, there's a reference manual. Uh, uh, we have guides to set up uh, uh, you know, the token server. Uh, we have an Ample Gurobi guide for, for whoever uses Ample. We don't, I don't think we have a guide, a, a guide for GAMS, and I'll, I'll, I'll make a, a reference to that. Uh, but our APIs are really well documented, and there is a lot of information. Gurobi, Gurobi uh, as I said a few minutes ago, it's a high performance library written in C, right? But around, around the library, we have lightweight APIs. So if you prefer to use a different programming language, C++, C Sharp, Java, Python, R, MATLAB, or C, you can do that and we support those APIs. I would say that nowadays, most of the uses I see of uh, our APIs lean towards Python. Python is a great language. It's very uh, quick to learn. We have a Gurobi API, a Gurobi API for Python that includes a modeling syntax. So if you use our API to build the optimization problem, you will find you will find that it's pretty intuitive and it's pretty easy to use and create optimization problems using our Python API. A lot of our customers use the Python API, and the fact that computers have become faster, memory is cheaper. I see less and less the need the need to use a lower programming language like C or, or C++. Of course, C and C++ are still used when you have applications that have to run in a, in a very short amount of time. But in, in most cases, I think Python does a, a really, really good job, and it's pretty quick to, to learn. So these are our, our APIs. 
Uh, to request a license from us, you can go to a, <coughs> sorry, you can go to gurobi.com and then our, under academia, you go to academic program and licenses and there you will find instructions on how to get a license from us. For, for support, for support, if you have any questions, if you have any questions, you cannot get the license uh, started or, or you cannot find your way around or, or you have any questions, feel free to reach out directly to me. I'll be happy to help. Uh, one, one, one difference between our academic licenses and our commercial licenses is that for academic licenses, uh, we, don't, we don't provide technical support, but, but we, 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 uh, <coughs> we participate when, when time permitting in our community uh, section of our, of our portal. So if you, go, if you go to our website and you go to community, as you see on, on, on my slide, there you have a, 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 a space where you can interact with other academic users, ask questions about different topics, about licensing, about the modeling, about numerics, about any, any questions that you have. And it's a pretty active uh, and nice community. We try to get involved as much as we can, but of course we, we run a business and our, and our, our time is mostly spent with, with commercial uh, customers. Okay, so uh, that, that is about uh, uh, Gurobi in, 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 uh, for, for academia. I want, I want to go now to the part that I, uh, that I think you perhaps, I, I hope you're mostly here for, and that is to introduce the concepts of uh, linear programming and, and mixed integer programming to provide the foundation. So this, this concept we're going to discuss now uh, uh, is what is implemented inside the, the, the tool. To have an understanding about this, is, it's helpful because it gives you a, a sense of uh, how to write a, a model, what the limitations might be on, on the solver. And, and it's a really fun uh, and intuitive uh, discipline, I, I, I find. So linear, linear programming. I, I wonder if we have a way of, uh, of doing a, a poll here, but maybe not. Uh, so what, what is a linear programming problem? A linear programming problem, it's a problem in which we want to minimize an objective function subject to other functions. All the functions in, involved here are linear functions. So we want to minimize a linear function f subject to linear functions h1, h2 through hm. All the functions are linear. The, the, the variable that we have is an n-dimensional vector. That's a vector x of real values that has a, a dimension of n. So this is a pretty ge generic uh, formulation. The key here is that the functions involved in this problem are all linear. Uh, the canonical way, the canonical way of writing a, a, a linear programming problem, there are different canonical ways depending on the, on the implementation behind the, the LP formulation. In this case, we are writing this problem as a minimization problem subject to inequality uh, constraints less than or equal to zero constraints. So uh, we have a, a couple of examples there. Uh, uh, the, the type of function we have, 3x plus 2x2 is an objective and the functions h, h also have to be linear. And there's an example there as well. So I think this is pretty straightforward. Let's see. Let's see, uh, uh, is this a linear programming problem? And I don't know if I have a way to interact with the audience. Uh, I can give a, a couple of seconds or maybe someone can answer. Is this a linear programming problem? Okay, well, uh, it, it is a linear programming problem because all the functions involved in the formulation are linear, all of them. The objective is linear and the constraints are linear. So this is a linear programming problem. We want to minimize a function over a domain of linear functions. What about this one? Okay, this this uh, uh, this is not a linear programming problem because we have a quadratic term in one of the functions in the objective function x1 squared, and that makes the problem nonlinear. We have a nonlinear term, therefore this is not a linear programming problem. X1 squared is nonlinear. So this is not a linear programming problem. What about this? If we're trying to minimize the difference, the absolute value of a difference between two variables. 
So although, although x1 minus x2 is a linear function, the absolute value is not a linear function. Therefore, this problem is not, it's not a linear programming problem. Uh, <coughs> what, up, what about this problem? This problem is linear in the, in the function and the constraints, but we would like to write this problem in what I refer to as canonical way. So is there a way to write this same problem in an equivalent way that translate in, translates into a minimization problem subject to inequality constraints less than or equal to? And the answer, the answer is yes. You can take any linear programming problem and you can pose it in the way that we, we refer to as canonical. So we want all the problems to be written as minimization problems subject to a certain type of inequality constraints. You don't have to do that in practice. The solver that does that automatically in the background. But I, I'm, I'm talking about this because this refers to the operations done internally within Gurobi. So if we take this problem, we can write we can write this uh, uh, objective function as as a minimization problem. Yeah, sorry, there was a there was a, a short gap in the communication. So we can write the minim the, the maximization as minus the minimization of the problem and multiply the objective by minus one. That's equivalent. It's the same number. And then we can we can multiply by minus one the, the inequalities that are greater than. And the, the 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 only equality constraint that we have, the only equality constraint that we have, which is four times x1 plus x2 minus nine equal to zero, that constraint can be written as two inequalities that are equivalent. So if you have a equal to b, then a greater than b and a less than greater than or equal than b and a greater, less than or equal to b is the same as a equal to b, which is what we have here. So we have written an equality as two inequalities and then the rest of the problem uh, doesn't have to be changed. The right hand side in the slide shows how to write the, the same problem on the left in a canonical way. Uh, if most of you are like me, uh, I prefer, I prefer sometimes when possible to see uh, uh, graphics because they they can provide an intuitive sense of what a problem is and this this is not just optimization it's any sort of problems so let's take this problem that we see here we want to maximize over a, a two-dimensional uh, grid over r2 x1 plus x2 so that's the, that's, a, that's a, the xy plane x1 in the horizontal axis x2 in the vertical axis we want to maximize the sum of x1 plus x2 subject to those linear constraints. So let's see how this looks. The easy one is, well, x1 uh, being positive. x1 being positive uh, uh, means that we're going to stay on the right-hand side of the y-axis where you see those errors. So that blue area is x1 being positive. Then we have, we add another constraint, which is x2 being positive. If we add that, that, that limits us to the upper right side of the of the xy quadrant, right? We have to stay in the blue area. If we just look at x1 and x2 being both greater than zero. When we add the third constraint, x1 plus 2x2 less than or equal to 2, boom, that's what we have. So the blue area that you see on this slide is the feasible area defined by the constraints. That means, that means that we have to maximize x1 plus x2, but we have to do that staying within the blue area. And the blue area is the area defined by, by those three linear constraints, okay? So how, how do we do this? How do we do this? Uh, well, one, one way of doing this is we can, we can draw we can draw a, a, a line of what x1 plus s, x2 is uh, for different for different values. So let's take the function x1 plus plus x2 because that is our objective function. And let's assign to that function different values. Okay, we want to see what's the maximum value x1 plus x2 can take. So let's just start in the lower left corner. If we make x1 plus x2 equal to zero, 
and we draw that line, that line is going to be the red line that you see here, right? And a quick way to verify that is to replace the origin 0, 0 and x1 plus x2, and that's equal to 0. That is in the corner of the feasible region. Now, let's increase the value of x1 plus x2. Let's make x1 plus x2 equal to 0 0.5 to 1 half. That will move the line a bit further to the right. You can take any point in that red, red line inside the blue area, and those points are going to be feasible according to the constraints, right? Because this problem is linear, you can infer now that if we keep moving that red line to the right, x1 plus x2 is going to start going up. It's going to continue to go up, and we have to just move the line as far as we can. If we do it even further, x1 plus x2 equal to 1, here we are a bit further to the right. You take any point in that red line inside the blue area, it's going to be feasible. You take, you can take one half and one half, and you will see that it very, it satisfies all the constraints. Let's go a bit further, <clears throat> a bit higher, 1.5. And if we keep going, <coughs> I'm sorry, if we keep going, you will see that the the most we can push this red line is to that vertex vertex on the lower right corner so if you take if you take uh that point x1 equal to 2 and x2 equal to 0 right that should be the optimal point why because we cannot push that line any further if we do so we're going to be outside of the blue area so we're just at the boundary correct so there it is 2 and 0 if you take x x equal to 2, 0, meaning x1 equal to 2, and x2 equal to 0, and you plug that in the objective, you get a maximum value for the objective equal to 2. If you take those two numbers and you plug it in any of the constraints, it's going to be feasible. If you take the first one, 2 plus 2 times 0 is, is 2. That's less than then or equal to 2. And the remaining constraints hold as well. So here you can see by this uh, diagram, a property of linear programming problems. In linear programming problems, usually the solution of the linear programming problem will lie in one of the vertices of the feasible region. In most cases, you will find that that is the case. The feasible region is defined by a polytope, and in one of the vertices of the polytope, you're going to find the solution to the linear programming problem. There is an exception, of course, if we take that blue triangle and we start rotating it uh, clockwise, we might find that the, the upper constraint can be parallel to the red line. In that case, we will have infinite solutions, but that doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. In general, as I said, the solution to a linear programming problem will lie in one of the vertices. So uh, I, I hope this, this was clear. I hope this was clear. We're gonna talk now about how to solve this from an algorithm point of view. So the, the problem that we just talked about, the linear programming problem, <coughs> can be written in matrix notation as, as follows, C transpose X subject to AX less than or equal to B. Uh, here, the, the, the variable X is two dimensional for the sake of this example. We have, we have two methods to solve linear programming problems. One, one method is the simplex method, which is very known. And the other one, which is, well, nowadays it's also very known, but it came a little later. It's the barrier or interior point method. So I'll explain how each of them work. The simplex method will take the feasible region remember that blue triangle that uh, that uh, uh, it was a it's a polytope actually it's a polytope if we take that polytope which defines the feasible region what the simplex method will do is since we know that the solution is in one of the vertices of the polytope it will it will find a starting point p1 in one of the vertices and then it will move along the edges of the polytope to the next vertex and then to the next vertex P1, P2, P2 to P3, and so on, until it gets to the vertex P5, which is the solution to the problem. There are different ways to, to move from, from vertex to vertex. One, one, uh, one uh, uh, obvious way is to take the vertex that leaves P1 that has the highest uh, slope, 
to make the best prog progress in reducing the objective function. So this is, this is a, basically what the simplex method is. The interior point method to solve linear programming problems is a little different. Uh, this is what we just said. This, the, the barrier method is different. In the barrier method, let's say that we have a two-dimensional a two-dimensional uh, problem. And uh, those blue lines that you see there are the constraints. So we know, we know that the uh, optimum of this problem is going to be at one of the vertices. So it's going to be at one of these intersections that we have here, right? And the way the interior point method works, the barrier method, which is the same name for the same uh, algorithm, uh, it's different. So in this method, we choose a point that is inside the polyhedron, that is inside. And then, and then we find the direction to traverse from that interior point towards the vertices. We make one step in that direction. We, we center the point in, in the feasible region. Then we take a next step and then the next step and then we traverse through the interior of the polytope towards the, the vertex where the solution is. So these are two different approaches. They're both used. They're both used. Some problems are such that it's better to use simplex on some other types of problems. Barrier seems to work better. And because both algorithms are, are, are meant for linear programming problems and they're relatively inexpensive what we do in Gurobi is we run both at the same time, and then whoever is, is done first is the one we use to report the solution of a linear programming problem. Of course, the user, the end user, also has the choice to decide, I want to use simplex all the time, I don't want to use barrier, or I want to use barrier and not simplex. If you do nothing, the, the solver will run both, and it will pick the winner to find the solution of a linear programming problem. OK. This is this is the the, the section on, on linear programming. Uh, uh, I'm going to move on now to uh, to MIP to mix integer programming. So let's let's introduce what uh, mix integer programming is, and you will find <coughs> you will find that uh, different applications that you work with. Uh, and, and power systems, mostly mostly unit commitment or uh, battery optimization or any problem where you have to make a decision, any problem where you have to make a decision or you have a, a variables that cannot take continuous values, but rather integer values is where mixed integer programming can be very useful. It can be very useful. So let's see, let's see. Uh, uh, Take the same formulation we had before, right? We want to minimize a linear function subject to linear constraints h, an n-dimensional vector x, right? What we're going to add here is that the vector x of variables is such that one or several of its components have to be integer. So let's say that you have an, a, a, a vector of dimension 10 and all the components are continuous except one, which is integer. That makes the problem a MIP problem. So as long as we have one variable that has to take integer uh, variables, that makes the problem a mixed integer programming problem. OK. The functions, however, remain linear, MILP, mixed integer linear programming. Uh, but the, 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 the difference is that some variables now are integer. <coughs> As a side note here, there is nothing that keeps you as a user to restrict that a variable is in integer or, or binary. And, and we'll talk a little bit about that. So when a variable is integer, and I, I want to repeat this because it's important that it's understood. If a program is a linear programming problem, you have a constraints, for example, x1 has to be greater than 0 and less than 10. If x has to be between 0 and 10, and the problem is a linear programming problem, then x can take any value between 0 and 10, 0, 0 0.1, 9.5, whatever. But if you make the variable integer, then x can only take integer values. It can be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and all the way up to 10. It cannot take values like 8.6. OK? All right. So uh, 
I, I, I think it's clear now that uh, uh, mixed integer linear programming, MIP, is the same as LP plus the integrality constraints that we talked about. Okay. Now, to reinforce what I just described, we're gonna we're gonna do a, a small example that I hope you enjoy and you find uh, intuitive. It's a very simple example where we want to manufacture some furniture. We want to manufacture some furniture. So on the left, you have a stool, a little bench. On the right, you have a chair, okay? And there, on that little uh, uh, chart, we have the money we expect to make on each of that. So if we sell one stool, one bench, we make $10. If we sell one chair, we make $11, okay? Now we have to, let's write this as, a, as an optimization problem. First, we have to decide how many of each we want to make. How many stools do we make? How many chairs <coughs> do we make? So the quantity of chairs and the quantity of stools is something to which we assign variables X and Y. And these variables are gonna be integer. Why? Because we cannot make 8.5 chairs. We either make eight chairs or nine chairs, but we cannot make a fractional value of chairs or stools. So the variables that represent the number of tools and chairs have to be integer variables, right? Okay. Now, since we know, since we know what money we make out of this furniture pieces, we can write our objective. We want to maximize the money we want to make. <clears throat> we want to maximize our profit. And then of course, since we know how much we get for each uh, unit we assemble, the objective is going to be 10 times X plus 11 times Y. $10 for every stool we make plus $11 for every chair we make. That is our objective. Now, what constraints do we have? Well, that, that will depend on, on a couple of things. And this simple example, of course, is going to be the material that we have available and also the, the, the men hours, the workers that are going to help us assemble this furniture together. So when we assemble a, a, a bench, a stool, or, or a chair, we need, a, we need the seat component. We need the seat part. So each, each piece of furniture requires one seat, and we only have 10 available, right? We also have, uh, well, that translates into a constraint. So for every chair that we make and every stool that we make, we add one seat to the formulation, and we only have 10 seats available. So we cannot, between chairs and stools, add up to more than 10 seats. That's a constraint that we have. Next constraint, long pieces. The long pieces are what we used to make the, the, the legs and the furniture in, in the back, I think. Yeah, and, and the long one. So we need four, four uh, legs for a chair and three legs for a, for a stool, right? And we only have available 36 pieces to make those legs, right? So we know that because we need three legs for a stool and four legs for a chair, what would that constraint look like? I, I wish I could ask the audience. I'm sorry, I, I mean, I, I don't have that interactive capability, but I think it's clear. I think it's clear that three legs, three legs per stool plus four legs per chair is the total number of legs that I'm going to have. And the total number of legs cannot exceed 36 because that's what I have in inventory, correct? The same goes for the short pieces. I'm not going to repeat this one. It's the same thinking, the same type of formulation. That's another constraint, right? So here we have we have an, an optimization problem where we want to uh, maximize our profit subject to uh, constraints. And of course, uh, something important that I, I, I left, I, I didn't say is the labor, right? We need four men hours to do a stool and two men hours to do a chair. So we have one worker, let's say that we have one worker and we have that worker available to us for only 35 hours, okay? So we have materials, we have labor, and we have our profit function for this problem. Okay. What is the solution to this problem? Uh, we're not going to do this here. Uh, if we solve this problem with Gurobi or you do it by hand, you will find that the solution to this problem, the way it's written, is 4.5 and 5.5. If we solve this problem as a linear programming problem, the solution is 4.5 stools, 5.5 chairs. Okay, that 
mathematically might make sense, but if you look in, re in reality, we cannot make four and a half stools and 5.5 chairs, right? Because we, we cannot make fractional values of a chair. We cannot make half a chair or half a stool. So this problem, it's missing a constraint. It's missing a condition. And the condition that is missing is that both X and Y have to be integer, right? We have to solve this problem considering that both X and Y have to be integer variables. Okay, let's see, let's see how this looks from a graphical point of view. And this is something that you're gonna find pretty useful when you start working with uh, optimization models. If you can draw, if you can draw for a problem that has, well, it doesn't have a, you know, n-dimensional variable. And this is a simple example because we have a two-dimensional problem where we can draw all our constraints. All our constraints that you see there are in the blue line, blue lines. And if you take the intersection of those constraints, it's the shaded area that you have here on the lower left corner. That shaded area is our feasible region. If we find the vertex in that region that optimizes our problem, uh, it has to be an integer variable. So what, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, if you look, if you look at the problem the way it is now, nothing keeps a continuous variable from being taken inside the feasible region. When we add the condition that X and Y <coughs> have to be integer, have to be integer, that restricts the feasible region to be only on those points that you see on that grid, right? So if you place the integer var uh, 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 values, which are the points inside the feasible region, we know, we know that one of those points is gonna be the solution to our problem, correct? So how, how will we do this? How will we do this? In this case, in this case, the problem is so small that if I took, for example, all the points that are inside the feasible region and along the boundary of that region, and I start trying one by one on the objective 10 times X plus 11 Y, I could try all of them and then keep the one that provides the highest objective function. That will be our solution. So it, that doesn't seem so hard, right? But let, 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 me, let me show you how hard this can become. And I'm gonna do that uh, relating to a, to a problem that I think you're mostly familiar with. And then we're gonna go back to this, okay? So let's take, let's take for a second, a super fast computer at Oak, Oak Ridge National Lab, a computer that can do 200 petaflops. That is two times 10 to the power of 17 operations per second. That's a really, really fast computer, okay? And then let's see how long it takes that computer to process zero one points, binary points in N dimension. To put that in, in, a, in, a, in a more uh, digestible way, take a unit commitment problem. If you have one generator, one generator, the only decision you have to make is whether the generator is on or off. Let's take one generator and one time interval. So on this time interval, this generator is either on or off. If we take two generators, it's a little more complicated because both generators can be off, both can be online, the first one can be on, the second one off, the second one on, the first one on. So we have four options. The more generators you have, the more combinations to try you have. <coughs> if we take one interval and N generators, we have two to the power of N combinations, different combinations of generators. If we wanna look at each of them separately with this supercomputer, let's see how long it takes. If we have 10 generators, we have 1,024 combinations, right? Zero one points to check. And that will take for this computer, no time, zero seconds, right? Because we're dividing, we're dividing 1,024 by two times 10 to the power of 17. Now, if we increase the number of points, let's see, let's say we have 60 points. Now we have more combinations to check, right? We will have 1.15 times 10 to the power of 18. That will take six, six seconds to this super fast computer. Let's say that we increase now just a little more. Let's add 10 more points, 70 points. Well, that is, <laughs> 1.18 times 10 to the power of 21, that will take 1.6 hours to check. 
that that is already a, a, a little of a, a little bit of a struggle. And if we go just you know let's go all the way to 120 points, that's a really big number, 1.3 times 10 to the power 36. That will take 210 billion years. So we cannot just enumerate. We cannot just enumerate. That will take forever. So we need a way to systematically reduce the search of the space that we want to consider. And that's something that I'll explain in, in a second. But basically what I want to convey to the audience now is that with combinatorial problems, combinatorial problems where you, where you have many decisions to make and you start doing all these permutations, doing a brute force enumeration works for a very, very small problem. So for, for a realistic size problem where you have a, a, I don't know, and, and I'm going back to the, my, my uh, uh, unit commitment where you have a, hundreds or thousands of generators where you have a, a, a long time horizon, 24, 40 hours, then it's impossible to do a, a, a enumeration. The, the number of combinations is just astronomical. Okay, how we do solve, we solve a problem then in practical terms? Let's go back to the problem of the stools and chairs and let, let's just stay with the mathematical side of it, okay? We have a problem where we wanna maximize this function subject to those constraints, but we know that X and Y have to be integer. <coughs> okay, let's start first by assigning our maximization function 10 times X plus 11 times Y to a variable Z, okay? C is gonna be the value of our objective function. We wanna know what the value of that function is, what's the best we can do for that function Z. Okay, for that number C. Okay. We're gonna find this function f of x, y to be 10 times x plus 11 y. That's gonna be, that's our objective that we want to maximize. Okay, so let's just start with a wild guess. Let's just start with a wild guess. Let's say that we decide to do nothing. I'm not gonna manufacture any chairs, any stools, and see what happens. Is that feasible? Yes or no? I, I am asking the audience so you can write down your answer. It's x equal to zero and y equal to zero, a feasible answer. It is feasible because if you take x equal y equal to zero and you plug that in any of the constraint, it will satisfy that zero is less than 10, 36, 41, and 35, and zero is integer. However, if you plug zero, x equal to zero and y equal to zero to the objective, the value is zero, right? And, uh, <clears throat> the objective will be zero. We have not manufactured any chair, any stools. We don't make any profit. It is feasible, but it's not really the best we can do. We can do a lot better than this. So we know that the optimum value of C, which is C star, where we wanna go to, has to be greater than zero. We have to have a profit. I mean, even if we make one chair, one stool, or one of each, or just one, that's gonna be better than doing nothing. But we, we do have an absolute lower bound. We know we know that we have to be at least zero. We, we, we have to be greater than zero. That's a lower bound of our objective function in this maximization problem, okay? We call zero an incumbent solution, and that's something important that uh, <coughs> if you are going to work with optimization, it's, it's something that you're gonna become familiar with. Incumbent means the best feasible solution that you know at a given point in time. So zero, zero is our incumbent. It's not very good, but it is our incumbent because we don't know of any other solution that is feasible. So zero, zero is feasible. The objective value is zero, and that is our incumbent. That's what we know. Okay, that's our lower bound. That's our lower bound. We cannot do worse than that. What about an upper bound? Is there a way to estimate a number that we cannot do better than? <coughs> Let's try to find an upper bound now, an upper bound. Uh, <coughs> we'll try to find an upper bound for our uh, uh, objective function. And for that, we are going to use the constraints to do that. So let's take, let's take the, first, the first constraint. Let's look at it. X plus Y is less than 10, right? If, if I look at that constraint, I can say that if I make no chairs, 
the number of tools of tools cannot be less more than 10, right? And if I make no stools, the number of chairs cannot be less than more than more than 10, right? So if you look at that inequality, x plus y less than or equal to 10, you can conclude that both x is less than 10 and y is less than 10, correct? If you multiply those two inequalities by 10 uh, on the x factor and 11 on the text factor to mimic what we have in the objective function, right? We're doing we're doing this multiplication here in the last row to construct what we have in the objective. So if you do that and then you add up these two functions, you end up with 10 times x plus 11y, which is our objective function, cannot be more than 210, which is 100 plus 11 and 10. That means that our objective cannot exceed by constraints, 210, right? Uh, uh, so let's let's add that. We know that our solutions have a, a value that cannot be more than 210. So let's that as a, as a low <coughs> as an upper bound. Okay. So what we know so far is that our objective function cannot be worse than zero but it cannot be better than 210, right? We know that our objective has to be constrained to that range between zero and 210, okay? So that's our upper bound. That's what we call an upper bound. <coughs> Sorry, let me take a sip of water. So now let's go back to our incumbent solution and let's see how, how good it is. We know it's not very good because we're not making any chairs or any any stools, and we we're pretty sure that we can do better than that. If the continuous problem is solved to 4.5 and 5.5, there must be an inner solution that provides an objective that very likely is between zero and 210. So this solution is really not very good. A way, a way, and this is something else that you have to become familiar with, a way to quantify how good a solution is is given by what you see normally in optimizer uh, 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 logs as the MIP gap. So the MIP gap is a relative difference between the bound <coughs> and the incumbent. Formally, the MIP gap is defined as the best bound minus the incumbent divided by the incumbent. <coughs> that relative difference is multiplied by 100 to get in a, in a percentage value. In this case, in this case, because our incumbent is zero, the the current gap is well, is infinite. Plus infinite is undefined, and normally our our gap is undefined where our, our incumbent is is we, we haven't really computed one or is not good at all. So we, we will improve that in our problem. Let's let's do better. Let's do better. A gap of zero, on the other hand, that's a, that's a question for the audience. If you can reduce that gap to be zero. That will mean that the incumbent and the best bound that you see on the chart are going to be exactly the same. And in that case, we have found the optimal solution to our problem, right? We are going to try to do that. So together, together, a bound and the incumbent, uh, uh, when they have the same value, that means that we have reached the solution to our problem, okay? So let's try to improve the bound and the incumbent solution for this problem so that when we do that, our goal is to see what, I'm, what is going, going, to, going to happen next on the animation. We want to reduce the bound to go down and we want to push the incumbent to go up so they meet each other on the optimum solution of this problem. Okay, uh, let's, let's walk again this path slightly differently on the chart of the, of the problem. And let's see if we can improve <coughs> The upper bound, our upper bound is 210. Let's see if we can improve such upper bound. This integrality constraints that we have create a challenge for the for the problem. So let's let's do something. Let's remove them. Let's remove them for a second. Okay. I'm going to remove the, the, the integrality constraints and we're going to solve this problem. If we solve this problem, when we remove the integrality constraints, what we're doing is something that you will see often referred to as LP relaxation. LP relaxation means that you're taking an, a, a MIP problem, you are 
relaxing a condition, in this case, the condition of integrality. So you end up with LP with an LP relaxation, which is just a linear programming problem. And then we solve that problem. When we solve this problem, as you recall, the solution was 4.5 and 5.5. And that's the dot that you have in the chart. If you plug that solution on the, on the objective function, you will have 4.5 times 10 is 45 plus 5.5, uh, uh, 11. I think that's something like 105. Let's see. There it is, 105.5, right? So if you take 4.5 times 10 plus 5.5 times 11, you end up with 105.5. So the solution of this relaxation yields 105.5. We know, we know that our problem cannot be better than 105.5. Why? Because if the original problem has integral conditions and remove those integral conditions, we have uh, less restrictions. We can find the best uh, uh, objective, which is 105.5. And then when we add back the integrality conditions, that's going to make the objective go lower. But it cannot be better than 105.5 if we add more restrictions, correct? So 105.5 is an upper bound for our optimization problem. I hope, I, I hope that part is clear. This is, this is called the root relaxation because we haven't branched on any node yet and what we will see what that is later. When we solve the, 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 the original problem and we relax it, by relaxation I mean remove the integrality constraints, that's what we call the solution of the LP relaxation, okay? So the less restricted problem, the relaxed problem yields 105.5 and this is an upper bound for, for us. So this is nice because now we know that before we thought, okay, uh, uh, we cannot do better than 210, but now we have more realistic expectations. We know that we cannot do better than 105.5. That's our best bound, okay? So that's a big, big step. We cannot do better than that number, okay? Now, we improve the, the bound of the problem, the upper bound. What about the incumbent? We are still left with an integer solution that is zero, zero chairs and zero stools. So can we improve that? Okay. Uh, uh, to do that, we had we had removed the. Uh, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Can we improve our, our incumbent? Let's try to do that. <coughs> let's let's try to guess a good solution. Let's try to get, guess, <coughs> I'm sorry, a good solution based on what we know. Uh, <clears throat> when we guess a solution, a feasible solution based on what we know, that's what we refer to as heuristics, okay? And in this particular case, in this particular case, I will ask again the audience to take what we had originally, which was 4.5 and 5.5, which was the solution to the LP relaxation, Right, and if we, if you recall the shape of our feasible region, common sense will tell us, okay, if we take those two numbers and we round them from below, that will get us to the next integer solution, which is feasible, that sits inside the feasible region. So if you make 4.54 and 5.55, that solution is feasible because if you take four and five, four and five will satisfy all the constraints that we have here. They're both integer. And if you plug them in the objective, you're gonna get, let's see, a 40 plus 55, that's gonna be 95. So that will be, that will be a, a, our incumbent. Incumbent means best feasible solution. <coughs> Since we're maximizing and our previous incumbent was zero, the objective uh, function was zero, and we're maximizing the next incumbent, which is 4.4 and 5, yields a value of 95, which is greater than zero, and this becomes our new incumbent. This is our new current best feasible solution. Boom. And this is a lot better. So now we know that our problem at least, at least has a solution of four stools and five chairs, and we know that this problem cannot be better than 105.5. That's our, that's our, our bound of the relaxation, okay? 
this is great. So now, now let's compute, let's compute for this problem what the gap is. So recall before our gap was indefinite. We couldn't even compute a gap. Now our gap is 11%. Ideally, the gap as we talked about a few minutes ago, the best gap that we can achieve is zero. I mean, if we can match the bound and the incumbent, we know that we cannot do any better. Here, very likely there is room for improvement. <coughs> So let's go back to our, our problem. We know, we know, <coughs> we know that, uh, oh, I'm sorry, let me take a sip of water. Going back to the difficulty we had before we derived that point using heuristics, we recall that the fractional, fractional solutions are bad, right? So when we solve the relaxation, when we solve the relaxation to this problem, this is what we got, four and a half and five and a half, and that is the red dot that you see there. So although that is in the in the feasible region, it's not on top of one of those dots that we have there. So it's not really feasible because it's not integer. So is there a way, if we can find a way <coughs> to cut, to add a constraint that only cuts this red dot from the, from the uh, feasible region, that would be great. Because if we did that, perhaps the relaxation that we were we will be left with can yield a problem for which the solution is integral. Let's try to do that. So basically what I'm saying is, if we can find an inequality that cuts off, cuts off the, the solution of this LP relaxation, basically I wanna cut away that red dot, but I wanna leave all the points in the grid. Okay, so let's see if we can do that. Let's see if we can do that. Cuts, cuts basically, and you will see that also with Gurobi. When you solve a, a problem, uh, after you run the problem, you will see that Gurobi automatically adds cuts that do not remove away the feasible region, I mean, as far as integrality constraints, but it will remove parts that make the LP relaxation tighter to remove points such as 4.5 and 5.5. Gurobi does that automatically, and you can see it in the stats and the log. We will see that in a few minutes. So let's try to derive a cut. And all of this <coughs> we're doing today is just for you to understand how the solver works. This is something that normally you wouldn't have to <coughs> do yourself. So let's try to derive a cut to remove that point that we don't like. Okay, so there, there is a, a, a way to do this with some uh, uh, algebraic manipulation. We have this optimum point. And now what we're going to do is we're going to find, we're gonna add the restriction that the problem has to be integer, right? That's what we want. For that, we're gonna add some integer slacks to this inequality constraints that you see there, and they are going to become part of our optimization problem. So we have a slacks S1 through S4 that we add to each of our inequality constraints to make them equality, and they become part of the variables that we are using to optimize, to maximize this function. Now, uh, we're gonna take we're gonna take this problem, and we're gonna go through some stages to generate a cut. <clears throat> first, first, we're going to do an aggregation. Basically, an aggregation is we're gonna take the two constraints in this constraints that we have, for which the uh, the slacks are zero. So if you take the first and third constraint and you replace on them 4.5 and 5.5, you will find out that it's S1 and S3 are zero. Okay, so we're gonna write it here. Okay, and now we are gonna combine these two constraints. We're gonna eliminate X, okay? And then we're gonna rewrite Y as a function. I mean, Y, y I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna clear Y of the factor two as you can see there, divide everything by two, and and then then we're going to derive the chi by weakening this this constraint. How how do we do that? We're going to take the, the the equation that we just derived. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry if this part is going to go a little fast. You don't need to worry about the details. This is just to show you how a cut. Not so much important how do we derive the cut, but what happens when we have the cut. If we weaken this equation by rounding from below the coefficients of the slacks right? You're going to see that y minus 3 halves plus 1 half 
less than, than or equal to uh, 11 divided by 2 becomes what you see there. So that 1.5 that multiplies S1 becomes 2, right? And uh, the the uh, the uh, S3 becomes zero because we're running from from below, right? Then then uh, this is less than or equal to eleven divided by two. If we take this number, if we take this number now, and we strengthen, considering the fact that all our variables are integer and the slacks are integer, that means that the right-hand side has to be integer. So we, we can take 11 divided by two, 5.5, and make it five, because we know it has to be integer. So it cannot be, I'm sorry, it cannot be, uh, uh, it cannot be 5.5, okay. If we take, if we take now, that constraint that we just created, right? And we add it to this problem. We add it to this problem by replacing an S1 uh, by X, right? We have produced a new cut. And the cut is what you see below. Y minus two times 10 minus X minus Y less than five. That equation that you see there that results in two X plus three Y less than 25 is a new inequality that we have created for this problem that hopefully will cut that fractional value away. Okay, and you can do this as an exercise after the, the presentation. But again, this is something Groby does in the background, but I just want to show you where the magic comes from. So let's see what happens with this new equality we just derived. We have that point there that we don't like because it's fractional on the LP relaxation. Now we're gonna add uh, this new inequality. And that new inequality that you see there it's the red line, the red line that you see on the on the graph. That red line is just below the point, so it will cut off that 4.5, 5.5 point from the graph. So it's removed from the from the problem. So it cuts the, the optimal solution of the LP relaxation. When I say LP relaxation, it's the problem that doesn't have integrality constraints. So solving the new Titan relaxation should give us a better solution for the upper bound on S and the upper bound on Z, the upper bound on C is the LP relaxation. So let's see what happens. Boom, let's solve that problem. There it is. We solve this problem and the solution is five and five. And this is without considering the integrality constraints. So as you can see, as you can see, that that uh, uh, cut made the feasible region region such that when we find the solution in a vertex, the vertex is going to be a point of integral values, x equal to five and y equal to five. If we replace that that uh, value in our in our problem, the optimal solution is well, uh, uh, the upper bound is going to be ten times five plus eleven times five. That's one of five for the solution of the of the problem. In this case, what, what happens? We know that our solution is one, 105 for the LP relaxation, right? That's the upper bound. But we also, we also know, what, what else do we know? What do we know about the incumbent? You see the upper bound went from 105 to 105.5 down to 105. So we improve a little bit the, the, the bound. But we also know, we also know that the uh, the solution to the relaxation is 5.5, which is integer. And because it's integer and it's better than what we had before, which was 95, 105 becomes our new incumbent. And because the incumbent and the bound have the same value, we have found the solution to our problem because in that case, the gap is equal to zero there okay so the solution of this problem is five chairs and five stools i'm going to re repeat one part that is key one part that is key we found a solution to a integer problem solving an lp relaxation okay and that seems counterintuitive so, so i'm going to spend a, 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 a 
a moment talking about that again. If you solve an LP relaxation, chances are that the solution of the LP relaxation will have variables that have continuous values, fractional values. However, by adding cuts, in some cases, like in this example, the cuts are such that you can create a new updated feasible region on which the vertex of that LP relaxation lies in a corner that has integer values. And that's what happened here. That vertex, which was our new upper bound, happened to be also our new incumbent, in this case, uh, 105. <clears throat> the gap, of course, is zero because the difference between the incumbent and the relaxation is, is zero. They have the same value of one, one, 105. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's uh, <coughs> let's uh, revisit this example and and do a, a more more. Uh, 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 I'm going to talk more about more things that are done within Gurobi to improve the uh, the solution of the problem. In this case, we're going to look at the pre-solved stage. Okay. So first, first, uh, uh, we're going to look at this problem, and we can see if we can tighten the formulation without removing any feasible points. Okay. Let's see if we can do that. So. Something we didn't do before, but we're going to do now in a second pass of analysis of this problem, is take advantage of, uh, of things that we can exploit. For example, for example, if you look, if you look at the third uh, uh, constraint, I'm sorry, the fourth constraint, 4x plus 2y less than, than or equal to 35, is there something obvious that you see? One thing that we can notice in this constraint is that because the variables are integer, x and y, and they're both multiplied by even numbers, we know that the summation of the, those two variables multiplied by even numbers has, has to result in an even number. So that constraint can be made a little more compact by turning down 35 down to 34, because we cannot achieve a value of 35 with the, with the conditions that we have on the left-hand side, right? And I'm going to repeat this. So pay attention to the to the rightmost line. It's going to move slightly to the left, right? So that that helps. That helps because if we if we do that, we make the search space a little a little smaller. In our case, this will not change. In this case, although we have made the the, the feasible solution, uh, I'm sorry, feasible space a little smaller. It's not going to change the solution of the LP relaxation because the, the, the vertex on which it is is not really affected by, by what we have done. How, how would we combine the ideas that we, we have talked about to solve this problem? Uh, how, how do we do this? <coughs> how can we use some sort of enumeration? systematic enumeration to improve the, the, the solution time of, of a problem like this. We're going to go back to this example just to present some ideas that in this case are not, they're not going to make a big difference because it's a small example, but in, in, in most cases, that's what we use. So let's take, let's take the solution that we had of the relaxation, which was 4.5 and 5.5, and let's see what we can do with it, okay? Let's take this problem, right? And we know we know that the root node, <coughs> when we when we uh, uh, if you recall if you recall, the solution of the relaxation is uh, 4.5 and 5.5, right? And that's what we have at the root node when we haven't done any branching on the problem. And I'm going to talk about what branching is. Root node is when we haven't branched on any of the integer variables. We know the solution to our problem is 105.5, right? And that's for 4.5 and 5.5. And we know that if we round those numbers from below to 4 and 5, our best incumbent is 95, right? That's what we have when we start. So something that we do in, in Gurobi and most solvers do this is we keep track of what our solution is 
in what the uh, the the value of the relaxation is 1.5.5 and then we do uh, uh, we look at at the values at the values that we have uh, achieved and then we decide we decide okay we're going to take uh, we have a strategy to pick in the variable to do this but in this case let's pick x we know that x cannot be fractional x has to be continue i'm sorry integer so what we do is to the original problem we're going to add a constraint saying okay because x is 4.5 then i know that x cannot be more than four right so i'm going to add that condition to the problem to force on the original problem a condition such that x cannot be more than four so it doesn't achieve that value of 4.5 if i solve that problem again then x is going to be equal to 4, y is going to be 5.8, and you can try this on your own, and the new solution is going to be 103.8, okay? So you see our, 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 bound, our bound became a, <coughs> it's a little lower, but we still have a fractional value on, on y. So what do we do now? We repeat the same process. We can do a new branch for y such that y cannot be less, cannot be more than five. So we force y to be less than or equal to five, to force it to not be 5.8. And when we do this, boom, look, we find an energy solution, x equal to four, y equal to five, and the objective function is 95. In this case, this incumbent is not better than what we had originally of 95. Right, and that's something we found ourselves, if you recall, when we rounded off the numbers from below. So we found the same result here of four and five by doing branching, right? So this is our incumbent. Okay, to find, to find the best bound, we have to do the other leaf nodes, the other leaf nodes. <coughs> so let's try now to do the branch on the other side. If you go to node, node one, where y is 5.8, we can do another branch on which y has to be greater than six. And then with those two branches, the branches on node one, one and node one, 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 two, we are preventing y of taking that fractional value of 5.8. If we do this one, you, you can see that, well, y now is six, yes, but now x doesn't have a, an integer value, 3.7 on that branch. Uh, uh, 1.2, and the relaxation is equal to 102.7. So this doesn't really solve our problem. Let's go go back up here. Well, well, we'll have to keep branching, right? We will have to keep branching because we don't stop branching until we find an integer solution. In this case, from node 1.2, I would branch on x to have x less than three, and greater than four, and that will be another branches. Okay, so let's see. Let's see how this looks like. Let's see how this looks like. <coughs> if you recall, if you recall, uh, if we take x equal the, uh, less than four, because we don't want it to be four point five, x less than four means that we're going to optimize only on the area that you see as red. That will be our first node that you saw on the branch and bound graph, right? If we optimize on y less than five, which is another node that we have, node one one, that's a small. It's a smaller area that you see in the in the red area, and so so we start constra constraining the area on which we're doing the optimization by, by branching. And this yields uh, one of the points that uh, we found in node one two, if you recall. If we go now back to the to the graph. Let's let's branch at the root node, but now on the other side of x. So instead of branching, uh, we did already the branch on x less than four. Let's branch now on x greater than than or equal to to five. If we solve that problem, so you see we're taking the original problem on the right, and we're just adding that condition that x has to be greater than five, and we solve the relaxation we're going to find that x is equal to y and the, and the objective function is 105. Because this solution is integer, 
we have found a new incumbent. Why? Because this incumbent is better than is higher than 95. And also, and also now we can take we can take the uh, the uh, we can take the, uh, the the bound and update the bound. And we have found a solution to our problem. This disqualifies all the other nodes that we have because our gap at this point at this node is equal to, to zero. So this is another way, another way of finding a solution to the problem by branching, by branching on the variables. In this case, it was fairly straightforward because we have only two variables and there's so much branching that we can do. This is the branching bound technique. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's 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 go back to the to the problem and show you where the, the solution is. It's right there. This this as you can see, it's a lot of work, and I don't expect you to take your unit commitment problem or or uh, uh, if you have any 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 problem you're working with and do this by hand. You can do it uh, once, twice, or whatever times you want. I mean, to to learn the technique, I, I find it quite uh, fascinating. But Gurobi Gurobi will do this for you. Okay, so so Gurobi takes care of all of this, but it's important that you understand because sometimes when, once you have an understanding of these basic techniques, you can see where Gurobi spends time doing heuristics, doing cuts, and sometimes if more time than, than, than if, if you see that a lot of time is spent doing cuts, maybe we can do something to improve the cut generation or the heuristics. I mean, we can take advantage of a particular nature of a problem to steer the solver in one direction or, or on the other. So uh, Gurobi will do all of this. Gurobi does pre-solve cuts, heuristics, branch and bound, and more. You just have to give the model to, to Gurobi. You just have to worry about creating your model and passing it to Gurobi. Okay. Uh, how how do we terminate a, an, an algorithm? Now, regardless of how, how you do this, if you recall, we talked about that relative measure between the best bound and the incumbent, right? You have the incumbent is the best feasible integer solution and the bound is the solution to the relaxation. Once you have the, the relative difference between them, you can tell Gurobi, I want to terminate the solver if that relative difference is less than certain percentage or if, if that absolute difference is less than a certain number. So you can tell Gurobi, I want, it, I want you to finish when the, the difference is within 1% or the, the difference between the best bound and the incumbent is 10. Most people use the, the relative MIP gap, but you can also use the, the, the absolute gap if it makes more sense to you. <coughs> I would say that the, what I've seen in, in, in some ISO applications, some market applications, uh, uh, a gap of one or two percent seems to be uh, <clears throat> reasonable because the lower the gap, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the lower the gap, the more nodes you have to explore, the more time it will take to find a solution. The solution will be better, but you will need more time to get to that solution. So there's a trade-off between the quality of the solution you want and the amount of time you're willing to wait. As I said, I've seen that in some ISO applications, a gap of 1% seems to be reasonable to solve a, a real-time application that has to solve every five minutes, every 15 minutes, and a gap that provides a, a solution that maximizes the profit for uh, uh, market participants. I mean, it, it seems to be a reasonable gap. You can experiment with this number. Uh, you, can also, you can also terminate Gurobi with a time limit, you can say, well, I, I want to terminate if the gap is within certain value, relative or absolute, or if the time spent uh, crosses a certain, uh, let's say if I spend more than an hour, one hour, I can terminate. So you can provide all this termination criteria, and whenever you meet the first one, the solver will terminate, and you can experiment with, with, with this. You can also pass, you can also, so pass the number of nodes. So in some cases, some users they don't care so much about the time or the uh, or the uh, gap. They they care more. They have an idea of the pro of the problem size. So because they have an understanding or an idea of how big the problem is, they say, okay, if I explore at least a hundred thousand nodes, I know that I've explored the uh, uh, portion of the problem that I'm interested in, or 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 this or the or the size of the problem the problem that I'm interested in, and then I can terminate the. Uh, the the algorithm or the number of feasible solutions. I mean, there are different ways to terminate the uh, the algorithm, and you can see this in the reference manual. Or you can ask me 
after the call for more information. Okay, <coughs> how are we doing with time? Okay, uh, we're gonna talk now about the, the login, the login, the information, the information that you get out of the solver, okay? And how it relates to what we talked about. The, uh, the, the solver, it's very chronological. It's very chronological. So when you get the solution, uh, uh, the, the, the log information, it's going to show pretty much in the same way it happens as we solve the optimization problem. So we, we, we will show you first the, the input data for the problem and some model statistics. We're going to see an example. Uh, there is a log for the pre-solve. The pre-solve is a stage in which we take a problem and we try to make reductions of the problem. So the pre-solve is just Groby trying to take the original optimization problem, LP or MIP, trying to reduce the problem in size and create an equivalent problem that is easier to solve. And then once we have a solution to the pre-solved problem, we can map the solution back to the original domain. We solve the, the root node, which if, if you recall, the root node is anything we do before we do any, any branching on the, on the variables. Then we have a, a, a section of the log for the branching bound section where we, we start doing branching on, on the nodes. So if, if you recall, we do branches. For every branch, you do an LP relaxation. We compute the value. We try to find a feasible solution with heuristics. So that, that part is shown in the, in the branch and bound tree exploration section of the log. And once we find a problem, a solution of a problem, either because we find the solution or because we reach a termina termination criteria provided by the customer, we uh, we show some termination statistics, uh, you know, about uh, the time spent, the, the work spent, the objective value, the gap, and things like that. So let's go, let's go over each of these. When you solve a problem, Groby will tell you uh, uh, what the, the model statistics are, the number of uh, variables that you have, how many are continuous, how many are integer or binary. It will show you some statistics about your model. It will tell you what the range of coefficients you have in your model. Matrix range is the range of coefficients in the in the constraints, the objective uh, function uh, constraint uh, uh, coefficient ranges. The bounds is what you have in the in the the bounds. It's the 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 range of the of the bounds in, in the variables. And the right hand side is the the range of of numbers of your right hand side of the a x equal b constraint. So this gives you a good indication of what your numbers are. There are cases where a model perhaps it's done in a way that some numbers are really big or too small, especially if the numbers are are, are out of a, of a, what we consider recommended. That can lead to numerical problems because if you have really big numbers or really small numbers, you can have a, a, a difficulty representing them in finite point uh, precision in a computer. So we, we give log information for that if we detect that situation so you can correct or scale your problem. During pre-solve, during pre-solve, Groby will try to take a problem. It will try to detect patterns. It will try to reduce the size of the problem to reduce the number of variables and or constraints. The problem that we solve is equivalent. We solve a smaller problem, hopefully. And then when we solve that problem, we map the solution of that reduced problem back to the original problem. So we indicate how much time <coughs> we spend in pre-solving the model and what the resultant model size is. When we solve the, the LP relaxation, remember we talked about that, when we solve an LP problem or <coughs> we solve the LP relaxation of a mixed integer programming problem, we report a statistics of the linear programming solution. We use both a, a barrier and, and simplex. And here you will see a, a, a log of, uh, this is a simplex log. So you have the number of iterations we do, how the objective changes, primal and dual infeasibilities and, and time, at, at time points on, on the log on which the uh, uh, progress is, is made. And then we show how much time it took to solve the linear programming problem and what the, the solution to that problem is and how many iterations and time were spent to achieve that point. We also have a barrier log Barrier log is when we solve the LP problem using barrier instead of simplex. So if you recall, this is different. The barrier method involves a factorization of a, <coughs> a matrix. Uh, we we provide an idea of the of the size of the, of the 
AA transpose matrix that we're solving. And uh, the number of entries that we have in the matrix is what you see in factor NZ, non-zeros, and the number of floating point operations that we need to create the factorization of that matrix. That's what we see in the first three lines. And then we have a statistics. And if you recall the primer uh, barrier method, we have a primal value. Uh, th this is basically the solution of the KKT conditions of this problem. So as we move forward, we have the primal and dual objective that we want them to be exactly the same, right? As we move through the interior part of the polytope. And here are the residuals. These are the errors that get smaller as we get closer to the vertex. And then on, on this next column, we have the complementary slackness condition of the problem that should be zero as we get close to the solution. Here we'll, we also have the number of iterations and the objective. And the, and the time, of course. Uh, when we solve, when we solve, uh, uh, and, and I promise uh, uh, the audience, please bear with me. Uh, we're going to have a nice uh, example. <coughs> I think this is necessary because it can save you some time when you're working on the. It gives you an idea what to look for when you start working on, on uh, you know, the applications and, and you run into trouble. This information is, can be can be useful. When we solve. When we solve a problem using barrier, we don't necessarily will end up <coughs> on the vertex vertex of the uh, polytope that I talked about. So there is a crossover phase that means that when we have a solution to the barrier method, we take the solution of that problem and then we push that problem to one of the vertices of the polytope. That's what we call a crossover a section of the of the algorithm. So we, we do a, a primal and dual pushes to push that solution that we have towards one of the vertices of the polytope and we do that with a uh, with simplex and here's the, the the part that i think uh, we spend most of the time looking at and and i hope that uh, as you immerse yourself in optimization you get familiar with this log is it's extremely useful it, it's a uh, it's uh, less intimidating than, than it actually has to be so basically here you have a you have a, a, a chronological information of how the branch and bound tree happens when we solve a problem. So, uh, in the far far left column, you have H or star, meaning that uh, every time you see an H, it means that we have found a feasible solution using heuristics. When we you see a star. It means that we have found a feasible solution by branching. And I think we saw a couple of examples, <coughs> right? Then you have the number of nodes that we have explored. Then the number of nodes that remain to be explored on, on the third column. When the explored nodes and unexplored nodes is equal to zero, that means that we haven't branched yet. We are still at the root node. Then we have a, a summary of what the current node information is. We have the objective of the relaxation of the current node, how deep the node is in the next column. And int in FIS, it means the number of variables that are not that are not integer when we solve the relaxation. Then we have what we talked about a few times, which is the, the incoming and the best bound, how they evolve over time, what the relative difference between the, them is on the, on the gap. And this is something that will tell you, this is what most people look at, okay? When you see a problem that, uh, the gap moves quickly to zero. It's a it's an easy to solve problem. When a, a problem struggles to lower the gap over time, which is what you're going to eventually encounter, I'm I'm sure of that. Uh, uh, you probably don't would like to see the gap going down faster. That can happen for two reasons: either we're having a hard time finding incumbents, or we're having a hard time improving the bound. So these two numbers get close, or or a combination of both. So normally we look at at these logs and we try to find parameters that change the behavior of the solver to improve, to make the, the bound computation faster, to perhaps be more aggressive with the cuts, or maybe to add more heuristics to find feasible solutions faster. So we have to find a trade-off of what things we alter to improve the or, or change the behavior to accelerate or, or reduce the, the gap value over time to make it more efficient. In the last section, we have a work measure of the algorithm. So here we have the, of course, the eight iterations per node, <coughs> it's the uh, the average number of simplex iterations that we use to solve the, the node relaxations. And on the most far right column, we have the, the time of, of the log. When you terminate an algorithm, you will find a, a summary of the, top, the type of cutting planes that we use to shorten, I mean, to make the, the LP relaxation tighter. 
these are these are typical uh, cuts that you can research on the literature that are implemented in Gurobi. That's why I was saying that you don't have to uh, you don't have to uh, uh, to create your own cuts in most problems. There is a way to do that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this right now. Uh, if if anyone is interested in providing their own cuts, please reach out to me. You can use callbacks to do that. If you do nothing, Gurobi will try to do a best guess to provide cuts in solving the problem and you will get a summary of the type of cuts that were used. You will get a summary of the number of nodes that were explored to find a solution to your problem, the time spent, the work units, and the number of simplex iterations. Something I didn't mention before, uh, but I think it's worth mentioning now, is that you can control the number of threads that you use when you solve a problem. At the beginning of the optimization, Gurobi will tell you how many physical cores you have and how many threads you might use, you might use. At the end, it will tell you how many were used. So if you have a problem of which you can spare perhaps some time and you're working in a computer with other people in a server, you can maybe use less threads to solve your problem if you find the solution time acceptable and then you make better use of that machine for the sake of others, for example. The work units that you see there on, the, on that line here, 1.67 work units, that's a deterministic measure of uh, work. So if you have a computer, let's say that you run on a com in a computer and it takes two seconds to solve a problem, and then you run again and it takes three seconds and then at 1.5, so that the, the, the solution time changes for the same problem. That means that on the computer, you perhaps have other processes running, you're doing something else, so you don't have the same resources devoted to the solver as you have for every run. But what is not going to change, the solution time might change, but what is not going to change is the, the work measurement. So the work units should be the same regardless of the run, regardless of how busy you have the computer, okay? When Gurobi solves a problem, a MIP problem, it will find in general more than one solution. So remember all those nodes that we saw, you're gonna find more than one solution and it's gonna give you the best one or what Gurobi deems to be the best solution. If you need more solutions, you can retrieve them as well. And of course, of course, you're gonna get an optimal solution to your problem, the objective value, the best bound, and the gap for that solution, for that for that problem. Uh, and finally, finally, I, I wanna make a, this, this graph, just to re-emphasize this is very important. This you see here is an optimization problem on which, which we're doing minimization, minimization. So the bound, the bound looks like a continuous line. It's not a step function because we're solving relaxation, continuous problem. We're trying to improve the bound. We're trying to push up the bound. With the incumbents, which are the solutions to the integer problem, we make discrete steps. We find a solution, then we adjust some binary variables. Boom, we get a, a, a solution that jumps and it starts jumping down as we move forward in time. And hopefully the solution and the bound meet each other some at some point or they get close enough to each other that we can terminate the algorithm okay so uh with this i think uh, we we should jump into a into a an example that, that i prepared and please let me know uh please let me know if you can see my 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 screen i'm going to present something different Yeah, it's, it's, it's visible. Okay, can you see what is the unit commitment problem? Yeah, yes. Okay. So this this information I'm gonna make available, this is not a full-blown, this is not a full-blown uh, ISO uh, type of unit commitment with a market application, no, but I think it's an example that is uh, uh, illustrates the use of Gurobi and, uh, and the notion of combinatorics in an optimization problem that I hope I hope it can relate to most of the audience. So we have here a simple unit commitment problem where we have we have a, a, some thermal generators, we have a battery, we have a low forecast to fulfill, and we have a solar uh, forecast. We have some uh, free energy that we can use. So I'm gonna go uh, uh, over the formulation, uh, not in too much depth, I think enough to, 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 to make the, the problem understood. And then we're gonna see how this can be uh, implemented with uh, with Gurobi. So basically, basically, when you define an optimization problem, when you define any optimization problem, normally the flow is, well, first you write in a piece of paper what 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 the goal is. This is a, a function 
that I want to minimize or maximize. These are the variables that I want to decide with the optimization. Some of them can be continuous. Some of them could be decision variables. And these are the constraints that I have. Once you have a clear formulation of a problem, then the next step is to do an implementation and we're going to go over that. Okay, in the case of unit commitment, basically we have we have a, a defined three sets here. One set will have all the time intervals that we do want to do the optimization over. And we have two sets of uh, units, one set for thermal units and one set of batteries, okay? For the thermal units, we have, you know, uh, known parameters like the upper and lower operating limits. We have the the, the cost coefficients that we use on, on a quadratic curve. You can use quadratic curves or piecewise linear approximations. It's up to you. You, you can feed both to, to Gurobi. We're going to use a quadratic model for the cost function of the thermal generators. We have also some battery uh, 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 parameters. We have a, a, an efficiency for the battery. We have a state of charge that we cannot exceed. We have a charge and this charge rate for the battery. It's a simple battery model, you will see. And we also have, a, of course, a low forecast, a low forecast that we want to fulfill over 24 hours. And for each of 24 hours, we also have a solar schedule that we, we have uh, predicted, OK? Our variables, our variables in this case, that we want to decide with the use of optimization are, well, for every time interval, I want to know first which thermal units should be on we should be off, what the, uh, uh, well, that's a commitment status of a variable. We want to decide also when a unit should start, when a unit should shut off. And we also want to decide, uh, we want to find out what, how the battery should operate, right? I mean, what the state of charge is, when we charge, when, if we discharge, we want to answer all those questions. So we have, we have all those variables. Some variables are continuous, like the state of charge, like the power of a unit, those are continuous variables. Some variables are discrete. In this case, any variable that involves a decision is a discrete binary variable. For example, the commitment of a unit is a binary variable. A unit can be either on or off. That's a zero, one variable. A variable can start up in a certain interval or it can shut down in a certain interval. That's a zero, one variable. A battery, can either charge on an interval or not be charging on an interval. That's another binary variable, and so on. Other variables are continuous. I mean, you can either be between 10 megawatts and 20 megawatts or any number in between. That's a continuous variable. The state of charge can vary between 0 and 10 megawatt hours. If the battery is operating, that's a continuous variable. So I, I, I hope the distinction between the type of variables is clear. With the variables that we have defined, we define an objective function, and that is we want to minimize the cost of operating our units in a way that we fulfill a low forecast. So here we have a, a double summation over all the thermal units and all the time intervals. We are not including the batteries because we're assuming for the sake of this presentation that the batteries are free to operate. So here we have the quadratic cost of the thermal units plus the startup and shutdown costs, which are the, the those costs times the, the binary variables for each of those operations. We want to fulfill here the load forecast, LT, and the load forecast is going to be fulfilled by the solar uh, power that we have available, but it's not enough. We have some solar, but not enough to complete the, the full uh, load forecast. And for that, we're, on, we're going to complement the solar forecast energy we have with the energy from our units. And our units are going to be both the thermal and batteries. That's the union you see here in this summation. We're going to do this for every time interval. Our thermal units are subject to operating limits. This is a, this is a constraint that I want, to, I want to emphasize a little bit on. When you have this constraint, please notice that the PIT, which is the power for a thermal unit, is subject to, uh, it cannot be, uh, it has to be more than the lower limit and less than the higher limit. But notice that these limits are multiplied by the commitment variable. So if the commitment variable is zero, which means that the unit is off, then PIT automatically becomes zero. PIT will have to be greater than zero and less than zero. It means that it's zero. The unit is offline. It's not adding any power. But if the unit is on, UIT, it's one. And then you have this PIT has to be greater than the lower limit and less than the upper limit. The next constraint that you see here, and, and I, I can share with you, uh, I, whoever is interested, please send me an email after the call. I can send you a, a documentation on, on this, this formulation and also on more complex 
formulations where you have more complex constraints. Okay, here we're not going to cover like combined cycle plans or 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 or, or uh, you know variable uh, startup time. You know you know de depending on how cold or, or hot the unit is. I mean those there is a lot of literature and, and I can share that with you. Whoever reaches out, I can share that information and you can do that with that with the solver. This this uh, logical constraints are necessary because if you have the commitment status of of uh, two consecutive intervals, they have to logically match what happens with the startup and shutdown variable. For example. If a unit starts on now and it was off the previous interval, this difference is going to be one. It will be one minus zero. It has to be equal to one, which means that W is zero and V is one and V is a startup. That means that the unit started on interval T. And the same goes for the shutdown variable. We cannot start and shut down a, a unit on the same time interval. That's why you either turn the unit on or you, or you either turn the unit off or you do nothing. And that's what this constraint is, V plus W less than or equal to one. These are binary variables. State of charge for the battery. This is a very simple battery model where we have the state of charge that we have now is the state of charge we had before plus the power we used to charge the battery minus the power we used to discharge the battery. And we include a, a, you know, a simple form of the battery efficiency if needed. The battery, we're assuming that the battery can be completely depleted which means it can go all the way down to zero and the battery has an upper limit of how much charge, how many megawatt hours it can hold. And uh, the output of the battery is gonna be the power that we use to discharge power into the grid minus the power we take from the grid to charge the, the battery. And we have of course, uh, uh, upper and lower limits of how fast the battery charges depending on the charge and discharge rates and whether the battery is charging or not. And those are the, the, the binary variables UD for charge and UC for I'm sorry, UD for discharge and UC for charge. Okay, now <coughs> let's see. I, 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 let's see now how this looks in a in a Python implementation. And and of course, I will share all this information. And I have more information for whoever is interested. Let me know. Uh, you can use this code. You can use this code uh, as a starting point. You can modify. You can change whatever you want. But this code is mostly meant for didactical purposes, just to show you how to use the, the Groby API, Python API, uh, to build a problem. Uh, a, a disclaimer here, this is, a, again, an educational problem. <coughs> the implementation has been done in a way that is easier to follow how each constraint is added. This problem is small enough that you won't notice, you will not notice a difference in performance when you build a problem. If you were to use this code on a problem with 100 or 200 units, you will likely see a performance degradation in the section of building the model, which means that the model building can be done more efficiently. Some, some uh, loops can be consolidated, uh, of course, uh, or you can use different data structures. So th this is mostly for, for purposes of this uh, uh, implementation. If you ever run in the case that you uh, take uh, one of these uh, samples, you create your own problem and you run into a performance issue, please reach out and, and we'll try to help you. Okay, so first uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna explain what we're gonna do here. We have, we have uh, uh, the problem I just described. We're gonna solve three versions of the same problem. We're gonna take a, a low forecast and we're gonna fulfill that low forecast with thermal generation only. Then we're gonna use thermal generation and solar power and then as a third scenario, thermal generation, solar power, and batteries. And when we solve each of these problems, we're gonna, we're gonna solve the unit commitment part. We're gonna determine what the unit commitment is, and then we're gonna do a, a, an economic dispatch on each. And for each of the scenarios I just described, we're gonna, we're gonna compute the, we're gonna let the solver give us what the lambda value is for each of the time intervals, which is the, the you know, the marginal cost for for the for the power balance constraints <clears throat> and my hope is well that the, the price of energy goes down as we use more renewables or energy that we're not uh, paying for so first first uh, you see here we have a couple of arrays where we assign the the load forecast and the solar forecast then uh, uh, this is the number of intervals in this case it's going to be 24. we have three thermal units Right, that we assign in a in a list, and then we use multi-dix structures, Groby structures, to assign to each of the generator different categories of data. 
the first category is the 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 cost that we have right then then we have the uh, the uh, the operating limits for the for the unit right and and here uh, uh, sorry let me step back so we're using a quadratic model so the coefficient that we're using a plus b times p which p is the power plus c times the p power squared those coefficients are here in this structure but in the same structure we can include the startup and shutdown cost so all the costs are consolidated in this structure we do the same thing for the operating limits and the same thing for dynamic data. Dynamic data is just the initial status of the units. In this case, we're going to assume that all the units are offline when we start the unit commitment. Uh, you could, of course, consolidate all the simple data in the same single uh, data structure, but I did it this way so that it's easier to, to read in or, or to scale or to experiment with. We have some uh, battery data. We have one battery. We have an efficiency for that battery the initial state of charge for that battery. And uh, we have the maximum maximum uh, uh, charge that this battery can hold. <coughs> it's the same as what we have initially. And these are the charge and this charge rates for this battery. We cannot charge faster than, than 0.5 mega, megawatt hours per hour. This is a slow battery that we're gonna use in this example. Okay, here comes the fun part. And I assume that most of the audience knows more uh, uh, Python than, than I do. I'm, I'm more of a, a old school C programmer, but I, I find Python very, very nice uh, 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 and, and, and intuitive to use. When you use Gurobi, the first thing that you do is you define a model object for Gurobi, okay? Where GP is the, the Python module for Gurobi. Here it is, Gurobi Pi. Okay, we're gonna use Matplotlib to create a, a couple of plots and NumPy which I think it's, it's widely used in, in, science and, in science and engineering. Once you define a model object, then you can use some methods associated to that object to add variables to your model. So if you recall, we're gonna have the output power, the commitment variables, right? For, for status, startup and shutdown, and this is all for thermal units only. So all we need when we add a variable is to provide the cardinality of the variable. So we have the, uh, the structure from which we grab the names of the of the variables and the number of time intervals we need for each of the variables. And we specify the name of the variable and the type of variable. If we do nothing, the type of the variable is gonna be continuous, but if the, the uh, variable is integer or binary, we have to specify that when we create the, the variable, okay? And we provide the names. Uh, we also provide the, the variables for the for the batteries here. We do the same thing. Since we have only one battery, we're just gonna provide the, the, the number of uh, variables that we need. It's gonna be one for each time interval. And here we have variables for the state of charge, the output power of the battery, the power during charge, during this charge, and the, 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 the charging status, if we're charging or discharging, we need for each of them a binary variable and, and the names of the variables. Here, we are going to define the uh, the objective function, that quadratic function that I showed before. We initialize the objective function to be an empty quadratic expression, which is supported by Gurobi. With Gurobi, you can provide linear functions and quadratic functions natively, like, like, like you see here. Once we define a quadratic expression, we use this double for loop, one loop for the time intervals and the other one for the units. And then for each element on the loop, we add a cost. So we, we loop through the, 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 the variables that we have times the coefficients that we, we define. And then we set this as an objective for our problem. Uh, then then uh, we have uh, the constraints, <coughs> same thing. We loop through the intervals, through the units, and then look how easy it is to add a constraint. We have basically, basically the, the, these are the variables for the, for the, for the power. These are the indices, which is the variable and the time interval, and this has to be greater than the, the lower operating limit times the commitment status for that uh, variable. And we add a name for that constraint. And here we pass a, a name uh, for, the, for, the, for the constraint. I'm not gonna go into uh, all the constraints here. Here we have uh, the, the logical constraints. If you recall, the logical constraints relate the commitment variables and also the, uh, 
the uh, startup and shutdown constraints. We have to make a decision for the first time interval because we have a, an initial conditions we, we want to account for. Otherwise, we're going to use the commitment status of the previous interval. And, and, and I invite you to, to, to review this code uh, afterwards. Here we have the, the, the SOC constraints, uh, state of charge battery constraints. OK. After we've defined all the, the variables and the constraints for our problem, we are going to define the different scenarios that we want to solve. OK. Uh, so to do that and to make the use of the code more generic, I'm going to define a couple of empty uh, uh, structures. And to those structures, I'm going to assign the summation of all the thermal generation for each of the time intervals, right? That's going to be this general linear expression here. And I'm going to also store the name of the, of the low forecast constraints. And there is a reason for that, and I'll, I'll show you what it is. That will, that will make redefining the low forecast constraint easier for each of the scenarios. So basically, what we're going to do is when we get to each scenario, we're going to add a constraint, which is the expression that stores all the thermal generation. It's going to be the low forecast. And then we're going to add to this term elements depending on our scenario. And the first scenario, if you recall, we're just going to do thermal. So we have no solar and no battery. So this is our uh, uh, power balance equation for the first scenario. We optimize this. We can write a, a sample model file, and I can show you that. That's really good for debugging. One, once we solve that problem, we retrieve the output for the thermal generation here, and this is structure. And then, and then uh, uh, we do the, the economic dispatch. So basically, in Gurobi, when you solve a problem and you fix it, as you see here, this will fix all the binary variables. It will fix them at the value that we, we found to be optimal. And then we optimize only on the continuous variables. When we do this, we can extract we can extract the uh, the uh, the pi attribute from the constraint for which we store the names. Remember, and this is going to be the dual the dual value of that constraint. So basically, the dual value of every power balance equation for each time interval that's the lambda value for our energy. So we're going to do this three times. You see, in the second scenario, we're adding to the low forecast the effect of the solar forecast. Right, And then the last one, we're going to add the low forecast, the solar forecast, and also the battery effect. So we're going to do the, the three of them separately. Uh, and, then, and then at the end, uh, we're going to retrieve all the elements for the last scenario, and we're, we're going to see how it looks graphically. And also, we're going to compare the cost of energy for each of the three scenarios. And you, of course, are welcome to take this and modify it as you please. So let, let me run this. I'm going to run this and uh, see. OK, so here, here, uh, uh, and then you see the, the Gurobi in action. So I'm going to I'm going to show you the graphs and then I'm going to go a little bit over the logs in one of the LP files. Maybe see here if I put it this way. And I, I welcome you to to have a look at this uh, uh, in in detail. But here here we're going to go briefly over over this. If you if you look at the uh, at the scenarios, you can see on the on the far right that the graph the graph that has the lowest average cost is the is the green line, right? And this has the lower lower cost. Like if we took if we took the area under this curve. We will find the lowest area because the third scenario is where we're using both solar and and, uh, and batteries. So the cost of energy on average is, is lower. The highest cost is going to be the the blue line, the the, the 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 cost that is higher on average because we are not using uh, renewables, and that's just when we have a, 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 a energy and no solar and no batteries. On the left. We have a we have a plot of all the different components of this small power systems uh, uh, example. You have the low forecast in the in the blue dotted line. You have the solar forecast. You see here it kind of ramps up toward midday and then it fades down. And then you have the how we use our our, our battery. Okay, the battery is a state of charge of uh, uh, 
uh, um, this is not a state of charge. This is the output of the battery, not the state of charge. So we see that we generate the, uh, with the battery only on the moments where it's uh, the energy, uh, I mean, the, the, the energy peaks during the low forecast. And then you have the, the thermal units to do, to do the rest, to have a, a, a completely fulfilled low forecast. If, if we look at the, uh, at the log of the problem here, let's take one of them. I just want to show you uh, the third problem that we solved. We solved three problems, but here, this is what I, I meant before. My computer is a small computer, it's a laptop. It has only four physical cores, but it has four, uh, I'm sorry, eight virtual CPUs, which means that it can use up to eight threads, right? This model is a, is a modest problem. It has a, a 360 constraint, 432 uh, 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 variables, and 908 non-zeros, right? These are the stats of our model. The numerics look pretty good. These ranges look uh, decent. We even have quadratic components, as you saw in, in the model definition, right? Look at the pre-solve. The pre-solve reduces the size of the problem. It removed 13 uh, constraints and, and 52 uh, uh, variables and 64 non-zero, so that the problem became smaller, easier to solve. Here we have the solution of the uh, of the uh, relaxation. This one was done with barrier, apparently, right? And this is the solution to the, to the relaxation. And uh, let's see, this solution to the relaxation. And it's a solution to relaxation because the last thing you see here is when we have fixed the problem to find lambda, where we have fixed the binary part. If I scroll a little bit up, I, sh I should see the output of the uh, of the MIP problem. Yeah, here it is. So this one you see, the same problem had uh, some binary variables, 160 binary variables, if you recall. And uh, this is a MIP problem where we're deciding when to commit the unit, when to a startup or shut down. And here you can see the evolu evolution of the gap we talked about. You see that the incumbent solution is found pretty fast. We don't improve it. Most of the work is done in improving the bound, the relaxation for which we use this set of uh, uh, cutting planes until we reach the, a solution of uh, with a gap of zero, which means that for this simple problem, our best objective, our incumbent, and the bound have exactly the same value. So we had really good cuts for this problem. So. Uh, well, yes, I, I think uh, I'm, I'm a little bit behind time, so I, I would like to uh, uh, open open the, uh, uh, the 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 floor for for questions before we jump to the to the second part. So I, I hope you found this uh, this first part uh, interesting, and please ask me any questions at this point. Uh, if anyone have questions, they can type their questions. Let me go to the. A uh, stream yard. Let's look at the questions. Anyone have a question they can write, it, please? I don't see any any questions. Uh, or if you uh, if you have access to the questions, uh, Shab, perhaps. Yeah, I will. I will read the question for you. But still, we have no question yet. Okay, uh, and that's fine. That's fine. Uh, uh, I'll make all this uh, material available for the audience uh, after the call. Uh, and, and of course, you can, and, and, and if you have questions after the fact, of course, you can also reach after the, the, the seminar uh, with yeah. questions. OK, uh, if we don't have questions, perhaps I can, uh, I can continue with the second part. Sure. Is that okay, guys? Or you want to take a, a, a five minute break? If anyone has a question, they can write the questions. Okay. Uh, perhaps, perhaps we we continue then. Yeah, no question yet. So we can come. <coughs> okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, we have we have until the top of the hour. So let's let's keep going. That's fine. That's fine. 
Can you see the part two on the on the display? <coughs> uh, can you can you see the part two a slide on, yeah, on your yeah, screen? Yes, yes, it's visible. Okay, so now now let's go move on to the advanced track. We're going to reinforce some uh, concepts here. Uh, and uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, different things related to MIP and, and, and SUC. So as a refresher, uh, as a refresher, uh, a mix into your programming problem is a problem where we have a, a, a linear function, linear constraints. We have bounds on the variables, but we also have the restriction that some of the variables have to be integer, right? We saw in the previous uh, couple of hours that this the, the, the technique the technique that the framework to solve this problem is based on branch and bound. We branch on the variables and we add bounds as we go. And uh, if you recall, we start from a root node, we identify a variable that is fractional, we branch on that variable, we solve the problem again, and we keep going until we find inner solutions, or we prune nodes by optimality by infeasibility, and we keep doing this until the relative difference between the best bound and the, and the incumbent, the gap, is within a certain tolerance. So I, I said uh, uh, that ideally we want we would like the gap to be zero, but in practical cases, when the gap is below a small number, one two percent seems to be enough for some applications. In power systems, I've seen gaps of one percent being uh, acceptable for the allowed time that is uh, available to solve a, an optimization problem. <clears throat> so I, I want you to think of mixed integer programming is not really an algorithm. Although it's, it's thought of an algorithm, uh, uh, MIP is solved using an LP base branch and bound. So don't, don't think of a, of a MIP as an algorithm. MIP, MIP is more of, the, uh, of a declarative framework that we can use to state optimization problems. So mixed integer programming should give you a, 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 a foundation on, on top of which you can lay optimization problems of different nature, and of course, in, in power systems. And this, this uh, uh, framework, this declarative framework, has a, a lot of research, a, a lot of time spent over the years that provide a, a rich mathematical foundation to solve these problems. There's a, a lot of research that has done in, in combinatorics and linear programming, polyhedral theory, there's advanced in, in computer hardware that make the, the, the solution of the problems more uh, available. We apply a different set of algorithms inside the solver. We just cover, we touched the surface on the previous two hours, but there is essentially a, a, a wide set of disciplines and algorithmic advances, advantage, advances that had been made available uh, to use within Groovy. So if all this, all this uh, research and all these tools and algorithms are used in a systematic and organized way, the solver can handle problems of different nature in a consistent and robust manner. So let's talk, let's talk now about uh, the, a trade-off between expressiveness and tractability of a problem. <clears throat> and this will give you, give you an idea of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the, the possibilities. And also, uh, I, I wouldn't say limitations, but uh, what to look for. <clears throat> With optimization problems, there is a, there is a trade-off between the amount of information of detail I want to convey for a particular model and how easy it is to solve the model. So e expressiveness is the amount of detail that I can provide in a problem. And tractability is the, how easy it is to solve the problem. It's basically what is the, the, the computational complexity of an algorithm to solve a particular problem if we know of algorithms to do that. So let, let's, let's put some, some context into this. If you take a, a nonlinear formulation of a problem, that is the most uh, uh, you can expect of <clears throat> when you describe a, a, a unit commitment problem, a, a powerful a power flow problem. We know that the formulation, for example, of a, non, uh, a powerful problem is highly nonlinear. We have a product of a, a, a uh, voltage is times a sine or cosine of an uh, angle difference. That's highly nonlinear, but really accurately describes accurately describes the problem that we're trying to solve in steady state. Uh, 
Constraint programming is also a framework that you can use to define problems with a great level of detail or a nonlinear model. The problem is that the more detail that you convey mathematically in the formulation of a problem, the harder it is to solve a problem with that level of detail in a reasonable amount of time. Conversely, if you have algorithms that are very tractable, that you know we have very efficient solutions for some problems, the problems that we can solve in a very fast time are problems that for which we have already assumed or, or in, in some cases assume some trade-off and we've given up on some level of detail and what we want to formulate. So we have approximations, right? So a linear system of equations is something that scales up pretty well, <clears throat> but not all problems are linear. A regression analysis is something else. Satis satisfiability problems or gra graph algorithms have very good uh, uh, known algorithms to solve but they don't, they don't uh, 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 describe some problems in, in uh, the physics of some problems accurately. So <clears throat> where, where does MIP lay on this graph? MIP lays around here, mixed integer programming. <coughs> so uh, of course I, I, I work for, for, for Gurovi, I have my opinion. Uh, uh, I, I believe y yes, that the, the mixed integer programming has a, a, a a fair balance between tractability and expressiveness. So although although with MIP, you perhaps cannot uh, at the moment at the moment uh, provide a, a highly nonlinear function, you can use approximations on that nonlinear functions that make the MIP of use acceptable and the solution of it tractable. You get a, sol a reasonable solution in a decent amount of time for a problem that reflects to some level the reality of what you're trying to to model. So. Properties of mixed integer uh, programming, mixed integer programming are, the, the, the main one is that because you isolate yourself from the solution of the problem, Gurobi does the solution of the problem, you only have to worry about formulating your problem. So uh, MIP is a declarative approach. You basically have to worry about uh, writing your model. If you have a new idea or you want to refine your model or change some business condition of your model, you can add a constraint. For example, for example, let's say, let's say that you have a bunch of generators of which uh, uh, you're not happy with a unit commitment result because the, the cost of two units is identical. So in some cases, one unit starts and one the other one starts, and you want to add a business rule so that a market participant that has certain properties has priority over another to start a unit. This is just an, an example. You can add what I just said in words as a one line constraint to, to your math to the, of your problem and that is declarative. You can add conditions as they arise to your model. Uh, that leaves, if you add more constraints, that doesn't change, that doesn't change the underlying structure of the MIP problem. You still have C transpose X uh, subject to A equal B, subject to some variables being binary or, or integer. That's not going to change. So the uh, the uh, uh, because the problem structure is not going to change regardless of how many rules you add, we can take advantage of some properties of a problem of which the structure remains unchanged. So let's see, <coughs> where where do the improvements that we have seen over the years come for, for Gurobi? On our last release that you have access to if you request a trial license version 9.5.1 at the end of this month, we are likely to release 9.5.2, which has some, some uh, improvements. You will see that for the latest version 9.5, we've done the, the, the improvements that you see on the slide compared to the previous version 9.1.2. So from the last version to this one, we have improved the performance of the solver for primal simplex, dual simplex, for barrier, for concurrent LP, which is when we use both barrier and dual and uh, both barrier, dual, and primal simplex to solve an LP problem. We have improved the speed of mixed integer programming problems. Also, the solution time for convex and non-convex mixed integer quadratic co constraint programming problems. Those are problems very generic where the constraint and or the objectives can be quadratic and non-convex. Uh, uh, so we have we have improved overall the, the, the performance of the solver becomes faster, faster in most instances, and in some cases is faster on harder models models that take more time to solve. So let, let's let's talk now, I, I wanna talk about what things we have used over the time to improve the uh, the, the speed of the of the solver. And, and it's very interesting because it relates to different disciplines that 
uh, we have benefited from. Namely, we have a graph theory, we have number theory, and we have a heuristics. So we have heuristics, uh, uh, which are basically basically problem independent rules that we can apply to make problems that in, regardless of what problem we are trying to solve. So let, let's go over each of these. So what are, what are by, by connected uh, components? If you take uh, the, the matrix uh, constraint of a problem, and we have we have a, a we're trying to 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 estimate the, the solution time. <clears throat> if we can partition the problem in a way that we separate constraints and variables in different blocks, usually this partition will result result in a much more efficient solution time. So if you split the problem, if you split the problem, let's say in this case we have three components, we will have three times the amount of time of each of the components rather than the number of the, the time for each component to the power of the number of components to the power of, of three. Uh, so the more the more components you have, if the components are disconnected, are completely disconnected, the solution time is going to be lower because the growth is going to depend, depend only on the number of components rather than if we don't disconnect the components the growth, the, the, the solution time is going to grow exponentially with the number of, of components. So let's see how this applies to, to the problems and what we have done with what I just mentioned. Uh, we are going to we're going to use graph theory for this. So let's say let's take that we let's say that we take a problem and we use a vertex separator in the intersection of a graph. So basically, basically an intersection graph, we're going to have one node for each variable in the problem. And in that graph, the edges of the graph are gonna be, we're gonna have an edge if two vertices are connected by a constraint, two variables are connected on the, on the constraint. And a vertex separator is, well, if we remove, remove a vertex, then we disconnect nodes in the graph. This is gonna become more clear with a, with a graphic. So let's say that we have this uh, uh, on the right, you have a, a, a graph that shows the constraint variable structure of a problem. We have two disconnected components, <coughs> and we have we have a, the, the red section are variables that are connected to uh, to the constraints in the blue and green areas. And I'm sorry for those uh, that have uh, problems with uh, with colors. If we map the graph on the right to the uh, I'm sorry the structure on the right, where we have the set of vertices v1, v2, and s, right? and you take the graph on, on the left, we can see on the graph on the left that if we remove the middle vertices from the graph, then the, the components on the, on, on the blue and green sides are gonna be disconnected. And then the solution of each is gonna be faster than solving the whole, right? So we have no variables, as you can see in V1 or V2 sets, that are in the same constraint, they're independent, but we have variables in the set S that are in all in constraints in, in both the blue and green sections. So what, what do we need to do in this case? We need to find an articulation point. Basically, an articulation point is a vertex that connects two sections of the graph. What we see there in the red uh, uh, vertex, what is on the constraint right-hand side on the, on the red area. So there are known algorithms to do this, there is an algorithm Bartarjan that can find that can find the uh, the uh, uh, the articulation point in a linear amount of time with respect to the number of edges on the graph. So this seems a lot, like a lot of time, but if we spend the time trying to find those articulation points, and then and then uh, we once we identify that point, we can either assign if that's a binary variable, we can assign a, a value of zero a value of one, by doing that, by fixing the variable to, to, to those values, we're essentially disconnecting the, the two graphs, the, 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 the blue and green areas, or we could do branching. We could do branching on that variable. Remember that we can branch on that variable if it's, a, a, I don't know, a, a, a zero, one variable, we can do a branch for a variable equal to zero, another branch for that variable equal to one, and then we have partitioned the problem, okay? This is much faster than solving the whole problem if we do this partitioning by the articulation points, okay? That's one thing that we have benef benefited from graph theory. Number theory also adds 
some tricks, some benefits to the Gurovi Optimizer. I'm, I'm going to talk about one of them. Let's say, let's say that uh, uh, I'm going to talk about something called as mo modular inverse reduction. Okay. So if we have if we have a constraint of the form ax plus by equal to c, both x and y are integer variables, and we have the a, b, and c uh, uh, coefficients or, or or parameters are all integer in a way that the greatest common divisor between a and b is one, then we divide, we divide, I mean, if, if that's not the case, then we divide by the greater common divisor to achieve that condition. But once we achieve that condition, then what we do is that we compute, we compute using an algorithm known as the Euclidean, Euclidean algorithm, we compute the modular multiplicative inverse of A, of A such that A times M is equal to to one and, and, and modulo b, which b is the, the second the second coefficient we have for the y variable. If we do that, if we can find that number m, then what we do is we multiply the whole constraint by m, as you see in the in the in the la, in line on the bottom. We take a x plus b y equals c. We multiply by m, and then when we do that, m times a x, m times b y, m times uh, c, and we take the modulo b of that equation. Then we know that uh, well because it's modulo modulo uh, uh, b, x is going to be uh, we're going to solve for x. Uh, the the coefficient m times b y modulo modulo b becomes zero, and then we're left with just m times c modulo b. So we eliminated y from the equation using this uh, uh, number theory mo uh, modulo inverse reduction. L let's look at an example. When an example is going to be easier, and you don't you, you don't need to. Uh, 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 implement this yourself. All of this is part of the solver. So let's take this constraint up there: uh, five five x one plus ten x two plus three x three plus ten x four equal to thirty one. We're going to substitute part of the constraint by y, and then we end up with five times y plus three times x three equal to thirty one. Now we have we have a constraint that meets the condition that we described before. We find the mod modular inverse of three modulo five, which is the coefficient of y. And it's equal to two. That means that two times three is equal to one in modulo modulo uh, five. So now now let's take let's take that that number we found two, and we're going to multiply by two the original constraint. We're going to have ten times y plus six times x three equal to sixty two. Now when we when we uh, uh, when we use the modulo five on this constraint, we solve for x three because ten times y in modulo 5 is 0, right? 6x3 in modulo 5 is 1. And then 62 modulo 5 is 2 modulo, modulo uh, uh, 5. That means that x3 can take any of the values that you see there. It's going to satisfy that equation. 2, 7, 12, and 17. It's values x3 can take in 2 modulo 5. So where is the advantage of this? We went through a, an Euclidean algorithm. We went through some a, algorithmic uh, 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 expense. We had to spend some computations to compute that number. But the advantage is now, if in our branch and boundary, let's say that x3 takes a value of 3.5 and the LP relaxation we saw. What we did before was, well, we know that x3 has to be greater than 4 or less than 3. But because of the computation we did just above, we can eliminate we can eliminate from those ranges I just described the values of uh, of uh, 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 three and the values of four, five, and six, right? Because they're not in the set defined by x three equal to two modulo five. That means that we only have to worry about x being less than two and x being greater than seven. That greatly reduces the search space over which we do the optimization. And in some cases, we have seen dramatic speed ups going from over 10,000 seconds to 0 0.01 seconds on some models, OK? And this can be very, very significant whenever we can use it. Can we use it all the time? No, but whenever we detect the, this condition, we we try to use it. Let's talk now about uh, uh, meta heuristics. Me meta heuristics is a, it's a, you know, high, it's a independent, independent, uh, uh, it's a problem independent algorithm that provides a set of rules that normally when applied, they add benefits 
to our problem. In this case, we, we can find uh, uh, integer solutions with, uh, with heuristics. Okay, we have, we have a, a, and I'm gonna talk about a, a, a couple. So the, the meta heuristics play a big role in, in mixed integer programming. Uh, uh, the basic structure is to do a local search through sub MIPS. What this means is if we can fix some variables, fix some variables and then solve the remaining problem, I mean, just operate on the remaining variables. And, and we do this recursively with, with uh, smaller and smaller problems. We can, we can do sub MIPS and, and this, this can help us find a feasible solution. Is it going to be the best solution? Probably not, but it, at least it provides a, a feasible solution. Uh, when we use population-based meta heuristics, the, 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 what we try to do in the search tree is to find multiple solutions, and we try to use approaches to combine the solutions we have to produce new solutions. A really effective heuristic that we have is the relaxation-induced neighborhood search, RINS heuristic, and that's known. You can research it. Uh, we, we use it in Gurubi, and, and you can you can you can see that in, uh, uh, when we use that that uh, heuristic when solving when solving problems. Uh, that RINS heuristic works the following way. So we take we take a, a, an incumbent solution. Remember uh, that is that it's an integer because it's incumbent. It has to be integer. We take a relaxation that is optimal but it's not integer feasible. So if we find variables that are common, that have the same value in both solutions, we can bind, we combine the two, and then we have a new problem to, to solve. Okay? So this will provide, this will lead to a different relaxation on each branch and bound node. And this will adapt to the size of the of the of the uh, of the optimization tree, mostly because it adapts to the size of the gap that we have achieved so far. So what, what I'm going with this is, in many cases, it's better to find a solution, even if it's not a good solution, and then try to improve it. Rather than trying to aim for the best solution or a good solution early on in the process, it's better to aim for a solution, even if it's not a good one, and then try to improve upon it. Uh, the meta heuristics uh, try to feed uh, uh, domain-specific solutions to the MIP solver. Uh, and uh, uh, the solver will try to improve on those solutions. So when I say feed domain-specific heuristic solutions to the solver, what I'm saying is that as a user, as a user, there are some things you can do, and th this is important. So if you have, a, for example, a unit commitment problem, and you have a, a, a rolling horizon, you have a rolling horizon, let's say that you solve the problem now for the next 24 hours, or if you do in real time for the next eight time intervals, Let's say that all, all the things you change from this current run to the next one is you, you have a perturbation of the low forecast. You could use, you could use if you have an idea of what the, the, a feasible solution is, you can provide a starting point to the next problem and Roby can try to use that starting point to improve on it and hopefully find a solution faster than if no starting point were provided at all. Something else you can do, something else you can do is with the use of callbacks, you can you can inject solutions to your problem. So as the problem is solving, as the problem is solving in the branch and boundary, you have access to information, you have the objective cost, you have the solution found so far. And if you can exploit knowledge of the problems that you have, the number of nodes that have been explored, the, the, the value of the objective function, and you want to in, inject a solution or, or a cut to your problem, you can do that with, uh, with callbacks in your problem. Uh, let's talk. Let's talk now about uh, uh, the progress done in, in MIP. This is a bit more of a his, historical uh, 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 background. In the 40s, uh, uh, the, the LP algorithm uh, was was devised by George Danzig from Stanford University, and in the 80s, we had the interior point by Carmarker. Uh, the theory of cutting planes in branch and bound is pretty old. It's pretty old. Uh, uh, from the 50s, well, or, or almost the 60s, the cutting plane and branch bound techniques were were known. But what happened back then <coughs> was that we didn't have the the mo most I would say the the, the sophistication and in, 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 in computer hardware that we have now nowadays. 
to run these problems. So if you look in the last 30 years, the, the amount of speed in which uh, uh, LP problems have improved in, in speed in MIP problems have become astronomical. Well, I wouldn't say astronomical, but really large 10,000 uh, uh, factor speed up on LPs and over a million for MIP is a lot over the last 30 years. And that's why problems that we couldn't solve before, like a, a unit commitment, it could only be solved, I mean, a, 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 a simplification using dynamic programming or maybe in some control centers, a, a Lagrangian relaxation, which is a decompo decomposition technique, in many cases have been replaced to use MIP because MIP now can handle a problem of a, of a realistic size in a time that it's practical when you need a real-time solutions for a problem. The machines also have improved tremendously in, in speed. We have faster hardware. We have a, a memory has become pretty cheap. We have this new processor super fast. We have to we can take advantage of parallel processing. So there is a lot of uh, uh, things that have uh, uh, worked together to benefit us in this in this field. Uh, here here we have a, a, I, I like this chart because this summarizes what we have done uh, with with Gurobi over the last uh, 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 14 years. Uh, I think we covered this uh, on, on the first part of the of the of the call, but I'm going to mention it here very quickly for the sake of those who are not on uh, the call before. We at Gurobi have a, 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 a test set of over 6,000 cases of different nature and different complexity of MIP problems. Those MIP problems, we solve them with all of our versions since version 1.1 to version 9.5 on the same hardware, and we measure the speed. So here you can see how the speed has improved by over a factor of 70 over the last uh, 14 years. And also the number of problems that we couldn't solve has been uh, uh, going down over, over time. The, the, the problem has been, uh, I'm sorry, the solar has become more robust. To give you some uh, uh, history of, uh, of electric power, the, the electric power was deregulated, well, here in the US, in some places in the world in the uh, late 90s. And uh, there was a need to create a, <coughs> a market for electricity. The, the, the challenge was to create a, a pricing mechanism that was fair, right? We had to use, a, 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 at that point, a, a Lagrangian relaxation. That didn't allow for the separation of some types of, of constraints, but we could separate the problem. And, and then uh, we used the composition, uh, uh, maximize the dual, and then improve the, the, the sub problems of each of the units separately. Uh, until until uh, uh, well we have uh, until we came up with a with a MIP being fast enough to solve the problem, there was an every report that I'd like to refer to from June 8, 1989. I'm going to read it because I think it's very it's very telling. Mixed integer programming MIP is a powerful modern modeling tool. They are, however, theoretically complicated and computationally cumbersome. So basically, basically MIP was available in 1989, but it was more of a toy. I mean, for power systems, for unit commitment, maybe you can solve some problems, but not problems that were reflective of, of a realistic uh, size in a, in a typical control center. If you fast forward 10 years from then, Bob Bixby, one of our co-founders, in a, in a, in a DMX uh, conference, he showed, he showed that MIP could solve uh, unit commitment problems in a reasonable computing time. And now that if we fast forward to today, we will see that the most in most uh, uh, control centers, uh, nearly all, every grid operator uses MIP to solve uh, uh, optimization problems, either a vertical unit commitment or, or or a market clearing application where we're trying to determine that the, the, I mean we're 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 matching uh, load and, and generation bits, and we're producing a, a, a for every node in the network we produce an LMP price. We have a, 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 a power value. I mean, that is done with MIP nowadays. And this, of course, couldn't be done uh, 20 years ago. Uh, it, couldn't, it couldn't be done. The, uh, the, uh, uh, something else I want to add, and, and, and this is a, 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 a something that I, I think uh, uh, give you a, a, a very good feeling about using numerical optimization. We have the Franz Edelman Award, uh, which awards in the uh, operations research operations research area, the projects that have the largest impact on society. So if we measure the collective benefit of this, the, the winners and, and, and what they have done with operations research with optimization, it adds since the price was created over $330 billion. And a lot of the problems that had been solved by this award winners involve uh, linear programming and or mixed integer programming 
problems to solve their, their, their problems. The last winner is uh, the, the government of Chile, which uh, used uh, uh, optimization to for the logistics problem of the pandemic with, uh, with COVID in, 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 in Chile. Uh, mixed integer programming. Mixed integer programming is used in a variety of. Uh, I think I mentioned uh, over 50 industries. Here we have some. Uh, we, we don't. We don't have to to repeat this. Uh, let, let's let's talk now about uh, 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 security constraint unit commitment. And I'm sorry, I'm going a little faster. Uh, uh, I have a time commitment at the top of the hour, so I want to leave some time for 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 questions. Uh, What what can we say about security constraint unit commitment problems? In what role? I mean, are, are they particularly difficult nowadays? And what roles do generic heuristics play on on, on, the, on these problems? So here here we have <coughs> different MIP problems from a collection of twenty five hundred models, where we have the a measure of the size of the problem on, on the on the both the scales are logarithmic. On the horizontal scale, we have the size of the, the number of constraints. And on the left, we have the, the time needed to solve this problem. So this is, you know, what I'm trying to convey with this slide is that it's not a straight line in the sense that the bigger the problem, the more the runtime, that there is a kind of linear relationship or, or some correlation between the size of a problem and the runtime. It varies. We have some small problems that are very difficult, and we have some very large problems size-wise that are simple to solve. Where where do we stand? This is this is where uh, most uh, SUC models uh, are, where you see those red dots. Uh, after pre-solve, after pre-solve, we have roughly a hundred thousand constraints, and and that's the amount of time it takes for for the samples we have here around a thousand seconds. These are fairly large problems, typical. Some are smaller, some are larger, but this is what we consider typical. If we look at the <coughs> the number of uh, uh, non-zeros after pre-solve, this is where this is where where, where we are. Uh, uh, this gives you an, another measure of the of the size of of the problem, the number of non-zeros, and the runtime based on the number of of non-zeros. And those are uh, typical uh, SUC problems that you see in the red dots from a collection that we have. Now, if we go if we go to uh, specifics now, <coughs> if we take if we take this is an analysis we did a, a little while ago from version 8.1 of Gurobi to version 9 of Gurobi. If we measure the speed up between these two versions on 70 models that we work with with MISO, Midwest uh, Independent ISO here in the US, on 70 on 70 models, the improvement of speed was 30, 30 times faster from version 8.1 to version 9.0. Uh, of the 70 models we got, of the 70 models we got on 50 models, we were faster. In four models, we were slower. And in 16 models, within 3% of the original speed. But I would say in most cases, we, we were faster. And this is a nice uh, uh, improvement from version 8 to version 9, OK? On harder models, harder models that were uh, 22 models, uh, uh, that are harder because they take over a thousand seconds. We were faster by 76% of those 22 models. On 90 models, we were faster. In one model, we became slower. And in two models, more or less the same. So I want to say that when we go from version to version, we're not going to improve our speed in all models, but we're going to improve our speed in most models. And normally, normally, if a model degrades performance, you can work with us. And we can try to find parameters after tuning to improve the performance of the of the solvers. Okay, let's talk about some some property of SUC models and and how we can benefit from it. So in 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 uh, SUC, most variables are are continuous. Most variables are continuous. Uh, uh, I, I I would say that in ISO. Uh, applications. We have a lot of virtual bits which are continuous. I mean, we don't have a commitment decision to make. It's either a zero or how, how much we dispatch along the virtual bit. <coughs> and, and, and the presence of virtual bits play a big role in finding good solutions. And, and uh, evidence of that is if you remove the the, the virtual bits on, on, on the problem, that makes the problem uh, more difficult to find feasible solutions, and it, it degrades the solution quality. Okay. 
the, uh, the, the problem with having too many options as far as feasibility, if you have too many feasible options, that introduces a challenge because you, you want to find high feasible solutions. And, and if you have a high, a, a lot of feasible solutions and we don't have a, a and we don't have a, a, a improvement in a lower bound, then we might have a hard time reaching a certain target MIP gap. And once we find a, a, that target MIP gap, okay, how do we decide be between equally attractive feasible solutions? Okay, for SUC models, we know, we know, and as I mentioned that the, uh, the relaxation is expensive to solve. So because the relaxation is expensive to solve, <coughs> it's difficult to assess how good a quality is. So this is something that you're going to see often when you go on, on, on your uh, uh, work in the, uh, now or in the future. In SUC models, finding feasible solutions sometimes is not the challenging part, but it's to prove that a solution that we found is good. We can find a problem that the solution is pretty good, but the MIP gap is 10%, and then we can spend some time trying to lower that gap and say, okay, this solution is 1%. I know it's within 1% of the best I can do. I'm going to stop now. To get to that point, it can take some time. So fi finding the, the, the solution to the relaxation can be expensive. And that means that we spend some time in the, in the dual simplex in most cases. Remember, we can use any form of simplex, primal door or barrier to, to solve the LP relaxation. But in most cases, we find that dual simplex is used. And that's why I mentioned uh, du the dual simplex here. We can spend a considerable amount of time solving the relaxation. So because the, the, the relaxation is expensive, <coughs> we need a we need a, a cutting planes. We need a good cutting planes for, for limiting the size and improving the value of that relaxation. <coughs> we also need heuristics that find uh, uh, solutions. Heuristics are good to find a feasible solution to, to work on the on the upper bound. And the cutting planes on the lower bound, uh, uh, on the uh, to reduce the size of, of the gap and, and and prove that a solution is good. So <coughs> the the best heuristics reduce the problem size, and the heuristics fix integer variables to uh to some extent. Fixing integer variables doesn't reduce the problem size that much because if you recall. In unit commitment problems, most variables are continuous. So we can help, of course, by reducing the or fixing some in, integer variables, but it, it only helps so much. We have other uses of optimization, not in power systems, in which all the variables are integer, all are binary, or there are a few uh, uh, continuous variables. That's not, that is not the case. That is not the case in a uh, in a in a unit commitment. So there is not much room for that diversification on the on the root node. We don't get to do a lot of exploration because we don't have a lot of uh, uh, integer variables compared in relative size to the number of total variables. And it's vital to make a, a good fixing choices on the few, or, or not few, but less than common number of inner integer variables that we have. So in the, in the root node processing, and this is going to be a go back to what we talked about before, this is the cycle that we follow when we solve a problem. We have a pre-solve to reduce the size of the problem, hopefully. Then we do an LP uh, relaxation. We generate some cutting planes to reduce the size of the optimization space and improve the, 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 the quality, I mean, the value of the bound, and some heuristics to find uh, uh, feasible uh, solutions at the root node. And hopefully, hopefully, we can find a solution that is within certain uh, uh, MIP gap. That, that we find uh, useful. Uh, two, two simple observations here is that we can use we can use at, a, at the root node with each pass that we have a different relaxation. We can use that that solution to the relaxation as a seed for a heuristic to find a feasible solutions. And also also the integer variables that have non-trivial uh, reduced costs. I mean uh, 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 dual information. We can use this uh, uh, to find candidates, to find to find candidates in the relaxation. We can find candid candidates in the relaxation by using their, their their dual information to decide what what to fix. This is uh, uh, 
not a general scheme that is used all the time, but, it, but it's applicable to, to unit commitment. <coughs> so let's talk a little bit about more the, the heuristics scheme. So, I, and, and we're gonna we're gonna go a little bit on, on detail on this. So we have we have a, at each root node. Cat, every time we make a, a cut, a pass, a pass to cut a, a, a feasible region on, on the root node, we generate a submit, a submit that fixes the variables when non-zero reduce cost. Those are variables that improve the the, the 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 solution of the problem, and then for each of those submits, we spawn a new submit a new thread to solve only that problem. We're gonna do this, we're gonna do this for every cut and every submip as many times as we have available threads or until we finish our, our root node. The main thread, the main thread in the problem will continue to working on the standard MIP and branch and bound. And uh, this will, the main thread will collect information on that main thread and whatever we find on, on the helper threads and any improvement heuristics that we find to solution, we will we will use them if they're found by other threads. All of this, all of this is integrated into the into the solver. Okay, so you don't have to worry about any of this. I'm I'm, I'm telling you about this to to tell you how we can benefit on the structure of SUC to solve these particular problems. So this is why this is why when we have a, a especially in control centers, if we have a, a very very uh, uh, complex problem or a problem for which we need a solution fast, we benefit from having machine with more cores. More cores means more threads. More threads means more parallel independent threads on which we can work on sub MIPS to find, to find uh, uh, solutions to the, to the problem. <coughs> Here is a graph of what we just talked about. So we have that, the pre-solved section, the L LP re relaxation, cutting planes, heuristics to find feasible solutions, and then we spawn sub-MIPs depending on, on the relaxation that we have. And in the sub-MIPs, we try to find uh, feasible solutions to, to our problem. So let, let's see, let's hear what happens when we use this helper heuristics in the sub-MIPs. Let's see what happens. Uh, and this is, this is again, the 70 models that we have for, for MISO. So if we use the default without sub-MIPs, you have the solution time on, on the blue chart. If we use the helper, the helper threads, which really doesn't add a lot of overhead because we are assuming we have a powerful enough computer with lots of cores, you can see that on average on the models, the solution time is, uh, is a little faster, right? So if we find if we find uh, uh, solutions faster, that means that means that we can get closer to the MIP to the to the relaxation that we have, and that improves that improves the uh, the, the gap faster. And therefore, we find the, the, the solution faster. We have a 1% termination gap, and that's the solution time we need to find that. If we have a, a even tighter gap of 0.1%, the, the benefit is, is still there, but it, it's not seen in, in, in all cases, right? Here, we have to do, a, a, you, you see, we have to do more work. We have to do more work because we have to find, we have to find a, a Energy solutions that are closer to the to the to the relaxation, and we also have to improve the the quality of relaxation if we can to find uh, uh, such values uh, such bound closer to the to the to the feasible solution to reduce the gap even further. In this case, within 0.1 percent. So we find solutions faster, but it doesn't necessarily help with the bounds and and therefore prove optimality. So. Uh, all helper threads start from the relaxation solution. So the, the relaxation changes, but it doesn't change that, that much. So uh, that the di diversification is we use we use some randomization, randomization to improve this process to some extent. So we fix variables we said that have non-trivial reduced cost, right? that we determine from dual information, but we can also fix a random set of fractional variables depending on the probabilistic nature of that variable, uh, considering that the, the value of the uh, of the uh, of the uh, of the fractional value they have. So for example, for example, a, va a, a variable that has a value of 0 0.1 is more likely to achieve a value of zero than a variable that has a value of 0 0.3. 
So if, if we exploit that information to know what to fix, we can spawn those heuristic threats in a more, uh, using some of this intelligence, some of this information, okay? If we do that, if we do that, look here, we have a few instances, uh, MISO instances, where we're using one main thread and, and 11 helper threads with some MIPS. And here we have the, uh, the objective function that we find with time limits of 300 seconds and 600 seconds, okay? That is five minutes and 10 minutes. And you find that when we use a diversified approach, the ob objective solution value is better in most cases, except except in the last row, when we have a, a that case a 116 underscore 119. So it helps, but in not in all cases. So it, it does have a, a, a uh, an advantage when we use this probabilistic uh, 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 way of starting our, our, our helper functions. So uh, that, that's what I had. That's what I had for, for SUC. Uh, my, my encouragement would be uh, for anyone in the audience to, uh, first of all, uh, the, the, our, our licenses for, for research and academia are free for one year. Uh, you have access to our community uh, 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 forum uh, uh, group space in, in our in our portal, where you can ask questions, you can interact with other users, and occasionally we get involved. You have my email. My email is fuentes at gurobi.com. You can reach at any time if you have any questions about anything I talked about today or anything I can help you with to get started or, or if you need a uh, maybe some literature on, on writing your own unit commitment. If you need a, a, some public information I can share, I, I, I can do that. If you have a, a, any trouble with the solver, setting up your license, the API, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and, and with that, I, 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 I welcome any questions that you might have. Uh, if anyone have questions, please type your question here. <coughs> I have one question about the uh, uh, termination. Like, can we define the time uh, in advance for termination? Like, if we have a long time for uh, programming and it takes long time, so we can define the time in advance that I want the result just in this time. Like, I want the result in 0 0.04 seconds or I want the shorter time. Yes. So when, when you start the optimization process, you invoke a optimized method, regardless of the API. At that point, you can tell the solver, okay, I want you to run the optimization, but I don't want you to run for more than X amount of time. So you can provide that as a parameter. Something else, something else that you can do is with a, with, with a callback, you could, you could install a callback in the solver and you can monitor as the optimization goes, what the progress is. So for example, if you have a measure of time and you see that you're making decent progress, what, what decent is, what for you is decent. I mean, you're making a, a I don't know, 1% a, a for each 30 seconds. If you see that you're achieving that measure, you can continue going. But if you detect at any time that you're not making any more progress, then you don't perhaps want to wait for two hours. You can say, okay, if I don't make progress faster than certain rate, I want to terminate the solver and give me the best solution. So you can do that. You can customize the way you terminate the solver. All right, thank you. Anyone have questions? So please write your question here. Okay, I have one another question. In the first uh, section uh, about the pre-solve, uh, you said about 4x plus 2y, which is less than or equal to 35, and then you said about 34. So how can we uh, like cut the uh, frictions? So like uh, we can uh, from the odds to the even. Oh, that that is something that is done automatically by the solver. So you you wouldn't have to do that. Okay. The pre solve the pre solving Gurubi will do all those reductions. It will replace redundant equations. If there is a redundant constraint, it will be removed. If there is a variable that by solving the linear system of equations, you find that a, a variable has a solution, 
specified by the set of equations, it will be fixed that all of that happens in the background. Of course, if there is something that you know about your problem that you can provide before the fact, you can help Gurobi a little bit, so it has an easier time doing the pre-solve, but all those operations are done automatically in the background. All right, thank you very much. Sure. Any questions are welcome here. Please ask if you have questions. And if for whatever reason um, the questions come after the fact, uh, you have you have my email. Uh, uh, you can pl you can please share my email with the audience. It's a uh, Fuente Fuentes at Gurobi .com. and uh, yeah, I hope I hope uh, uh, you all find the, the the presentation useful, and it sparks interest to start uh, using the the solver. This is a very fascinating uh, time. The the uh, there, there is a, 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 a lot of use now for, for data science in different disciplines, not just power systems. So storage has become cheaper. Computing power has become pretty affordable. So the, the, the analysis of data to produce better forecasts, better, better decisions is, is there. And if that can be used in conjunction with numerical optimization, it's a really, really powerful uh, combination. Yeah. And uh, this... Uh... Uh, workshop will be available on REEE PSYP page, so you can uh, watch it anytime. Well, great. Uh, Sha, well, uh, uh, if if there are no no questions, then I'll, I I think we can we can uh, uh, conclude this uh, presentation. Uh, I yeah. want again. I, I want again to thank you for organizing this, and and yeah, and also I want to thank you for for uh, allowing me to uh, uh, privilege to be in front of this audience. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank uh, thank you very much uh, for giving us time and uh, share this fruitful knowledge with us. And I'm very thankful to you, your team, and especially thanks to Colm Devin, Senior Global Marketing Manager, uh, Isila Warner, and Jason Morris for this, everything that they, they, they struggle for this. And from a few months, we uh, discuss these things. At last, uh, it happens. And I'm really thankful to everyone. And uh, I'm very thankful to all audience who attend this. And uh, you can watch this on IEEE PSYP. Thank you very much. And have a nice day. Thank you, guys. Have a good, good afternoon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.